relentless noon sun blazed upon a vast expanse of rolling sand dunes. Screams and anguish cries were punctuated or drowned out by the occasional thunderous roar of magic or otherworldly beings. Two kingdoms were engaged in a fierce battle for supremacy. On this unforgiving landscape, the kingdom of Alma, donned in their thick plate armor, had invaded the small tribal kingdom of Dravia. They coveted Dravia's rare resources and their prosperous trade cities. A Dravian tribesman of Islabal had spotted the convoy of Alman soldiers. He had managed to rally his clan and one other, Islamar, to slow down the Alman march. They used hit-and-run tactics, but as the Almonds made their way across the massive sandfields, the clans no longer had the cover to maintain their strategy. They were forced to wait for the other clans, as the Almonds drew ever closer to their capital city. As the twelve tribes of Dravia and the capital city's army moved to join the battle, the tribes that were already there had a tough choice to make. Do they retreat to the capital, or do they challenge the Almonds, outnumbered, in an environment wholly their own? They decided on the latter. To even the odds, they devoted their clan's wishes to summoning abominations from other realms that they could only control for a brief time. They would send these grotesqueries charging at the almond line with reckless abandon. They would slaughter whoever was unfortunate enough to be near them before being put down. As more and more of the clans showed up, the battle shifted into an all-out war. A plethora of impromptu tents punctuated the battlefield's periphery. On one side of this tumultuous tableau, with tents of various colors, the Dravians stood united for the first time in decades. Their attire, a harmonious blend of colorful hues, flowed like a river between the tents. Their witches swirled in a mesmerizing choreography, spellcasting as they danced in swaying, hypnotic motions. Their gold chains bounced in rhythm, creating a soft ringing song. Men and women, their garments billowing like silken banners in the desert breeze, intermittently united to invoke powerful summonings. They conjured forth the grotesque and the shrill. Exhausted, they slumped to the ground as the unholy minions skittered towards the front line, their own soldiers fleeing his path. In stark contrast with the Kingdom of Alma, their formations were ones of rigid divisions, sharply demarcated. Standard bearers separated the immaculate black and gold tents from the fighting. They flew the flags of the houses of their nobles, but next to every house flew the, their kingdoms. In the middle of their tents sat a larger one, more adorned than the others. It proudly displayed the might of a king. Nearby, a circle of wizards in obsidian robes flung spells of devastation that spiraled onto the battlefield. At the back of the sprawling Gravian camp, a freshly arrived caravan is unloading its goods beneath the merciless midday sun. Days had dragged on since the initial clash, and this caravan was the last of their reinforcements, likely the last resupply for the meager camp. Weariness itched deep lines into the soldiers' faces. Had it not been for the almond forces' heavy armor and the scorching sun, they might have already been overrun. It took time to gather the nomadic tribes of Dravia, and the almonds' unpreparedness had bought them that time. Unfortunately for Dravia, though, the almonds learned pretty quickly how to avoid inflicting their own men with heat stroke. They adopted the use of magically cool stones and reduced their reliance on their signature bulky metal armor. Beside the caravan stood a large tent, quickly erected upon their arrival, and uniquely guarded by chainmail clad sentries, a rare sight in the Dravian camp. The guards brandished large metal halberds of extraordinary length. Leah, a tan girl in a simple one piece dress wearing a large steel collar, approached the entrance of the tent, carrying a silver tray of food. The guard at the entrance greeted her with a nod. She returned the gesture solemnly. Then she was joined by two guards on both sides of her. The guard opened the tent's entrance, and Leah walked in with her escort. Expensive rugs lined the floor of the sand-laden, fully furnished tent. Desks made of fine wood, gleaming gold lamps, and silver water decanters lay about the space. A luxurious bed stood prominently, an iron chest at its foot. Contrary to the opulence of the tent, a large metal X sat upright in the middle of the room. It was made of thick iron beams, and it was firmly anchored to the floor. Each arm and leg of its iron beams had a hole in it, with a large metal chain running out of it. Positioned in the center of the X, a lever faced the entrance. The chains ran to the wrists and legs of a short, darkly tanned man with long, wavy black hair. He was heavily tattooed with black symbols in the shape of chains, and he wore nothing but a pair of loose-fitting white pants. Seated at the back wall of the tent, he wrote in a leather-bound book at one of the desks. He didn't look up when the group entered, and one of the guards, Caled, gave Leah a slight shove, prodding her to speak. She cleared her throat, then in a reverent tone, said, It is time. He looked at her and sighed as he set the quill into his ink pot. Leah set the tray of food next to him, on a small, ornate end table without meeting his gaze. Then she walked to a corner of the tent and grabbed a large, plain clay pot. The pot, much like the metal X, looked out of place among the finery of the tent. She cradled the pot between her hands as she stood a pace away from him, her eyes firmly on the floor. You should eat while you can, Godwolf, she said in a whisper. The heavily tattooed man grabbed a grape from the silver tray. He spun it as he looked it over. 
have you? He replied quietly. Her eyes darted to meet his, a brief sneer flashing across her face, before they returned to the floor. Yes, Godwolf, of course I have. But I am hardly the one who needs their strength, she said sternly. He smiled, but it didn't touch his eyes. Let's just get on with it, he said. Caleb grunted in surprise, but despite it, he moved up to the lever on the X. A shock look slipped across Leah's face as she looked up at Wolf's, but after meeting his cold, dead gaze, she nodded and fetched a silver water decanter. She poured it into the clay pot and mixed it as he stood up from the writing desk, the thick iron chains jingling as he moved. He approached the metal X, aligning his arms and feet with its structure. Leah finished mixing the pot, and as she grabbed a large paintbrush, she nodded to the guard. Sorry about this, God Wolf, Caleb said, a tinge of remorse touching his voice. Wolf met the guard's eyes and nodded. Trust me, I understand, he replied firmly. Caleb pulled the lever. A hurried, horrendously loud clicking sound reverberated throughout the tent as the loose chain links were pulled into the X. Wolf let out an involuntary yelp as he was pulled with the links into the X with a sickening metallic crunch. Born a slave and christened with the name Wolf in the unforgiving fighting pits, his life had been one of hardship mixed with brutality. However, when his latent ender powers had finally manifested, he had been elevated to a status akin to that of a god among his people. Now, he wore chains of a different kind. He found them all to be the same. The chains of slavery, the chains on a fighter in the pit, the chains tattooed across the skin that marked him as an ender, the iron chains on his arms now. Leah grabbed the large clay pot and set it next to the bound wolf. Then she grabbed the chair he had been sitting in. She sat behind him, dipped the brush into the pot, and began to sweep it gently across his back, starting from his left shoulder. The dark ink she used covered his tattoos, sometimes tracing them, but mostly making large circular designs. She finished his back quickly despite her tender touch, and Caleb released the lever. Wolf let out a deep breath as if he had been underwater. He turned himself over to face Leah in the chair. She nodded in improvement, and the guard pulled the lever again. Once again, he is pulled into the X, and the breath is knocked out of him as he is lifted off the ground. Leah waited a moment, and they began the process again, careful not to look him in the face. He made an effort to stare straight ahead as he let his mind wander. The intricate tattoos that marked him as an ender spread across his body from his left shoulder when he used his power. The more power he used, the more it spread. He knew the legends. When the tattoos spread all the way across his body, that would be it. His life would be forfeit to those very same powers. Against the backdrop of sweeping sand dunes and makeshift tents, the camp was abuzz with a sense of urgency. The distant echoes of battle, the clash of still against still, the anguished cries of wounded warriors served as a constant reminder of what was at stake and the harrowing conflict that raged out there, beyond this tent. Leah stood, her task done. Caleb released the lever again, freeing Wolf. The other guard who walked in with Leah left, and Caleb moved back to the tent's entrance. Wolf walked to the other side of the X, towards the entrance, and he put his arms out to his sides, posing in a cross. Leah grabbed a vest lined with tiny steel rings and slung it over him, guiding his hands through the armholes. He didn't seem to feel her touch. His eyes were forward, facing the guard Caleb, glazed over. She strapped leg armor on him, and then she threw a pair of sandals in front of him. He stepped into them, still looking forward. Silently, she extends her hand towards him, wrists up. Capturing his attention, he mirrors the gesture. She pulled the chain on his wrist tight, then slapped a leather arm protector on him. Then she did the same for the other. He continued to stare straight ahead, his arms held forward, wrists up, as Leah pulled his long black hair back and began braiding it with leather and gold. When she was done, she pulled a full metal face mask from the iron chest. It was a plain thing, undecorated, with two leather bands that crisscrossed on the back. She put it on him with all the respect one does a king with his crown. After putting the mask on him, Leah stepped to his right side and turned to face the entrance with him, her hands clasped in front of her. Caleb opened the tent's entrance and motioned to the guard outside. A moment later, a man walked in dressed in fine white and red robes made of silk. He wore a golden mask in much the same fashion as the one Wolf wore, but jewels lined that golden crest. His armor, too, was akin to Wolf's, with the added exception of gold and jewels. He's accompanied by the guard who previously left. The man with the golden mask nodded at Leah, then at Caleb. They both bowed and left without a word spoken. He looked Wolf up and down, appraising him, as Wolf stood with his wrist out. Can you do this? He said to Wolf, looking him in the eyes. He didn't respond. 
I suppose it doesn't really matter if you can, the man in the golden mask said dryly. He reached into his robes, producing a leather pouch from around his neck. He pulled a large golden key from it and pulled Wolf's wrists roughly towards him. He slapped the key into the iron rings and unlocked them. Then he got on his knees and unlocked Wolf's ankles. Still on his knees, he looked up at Wolf and said in a hushed reverence, Do what you always do. Protect your people. Wolf met his gaze and finally let his arms drop to his sides. He gave a single nod in affirmation to the man in the gold mask. The man stood and turned, leaving the tent. A moment later, he shouted outside, To victory! As the lone guard held the tent flap open, Wolf emerged. A profound hush blanketed the camp before it erupted into thunderous cheers. The guards who ringed the tent now moved forward, clearing a lane to the front line. A group of Dravia witches started running down the line of guards, screaming, singing, and dancing their way through the onlookers. Wolf didn't need the legends to tell him what he already knew was coming. He didn't mourn his short, tragic life. In a way, he had already lived multiple lives. He was worried for them, though. Despite the adulation he received, he remained a captive in many ways. Today, those chains would be wielded as a weapon. With a determined resolve, Wolf took his first step towards the battlefield. Leah's role in the camp was that of his servant, a position that had brought her into Wolf's life in a unique way. She cared for him, but it was a care born out of necessity rather than affection. Her interactions with Wolf were marked by an unspoken understanding, a bond formed in their shared crucible of an existence. In the beginning, when she had first been assigned to serve the Ender known as Wolf, fear had been her constant companion. His reputation as a fierce warrior had preceded him, and the stories of his brutality in the fighting pit had sent shivers down her spine. But as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, she discovered a different side of the bestial man. He had saved her from the cruel lash of a whip when clumsiness had earned her the wrath of their masters. He had offered her food when her stomach had growled in hunger. She knew better than to mistake these acts of kindness for friendship. Her loyalty to Wolf was a pragmatic one, driven by the survival instincts that had served her well in the unforgiving desert. In this world, trust was a rare, precious commodity, and she had learned to rely on herself above all else. As she watched Wolf head to the battle, her heart heavy with a sense of foreboding, Leah couldn't help but wonder about the man behind the chains. What secrets did he hold? What memories lurked within the depths of his tattooed skin? The briar symbol that had adorned his left shoulder, when she was near it, seemed to pulse with a life of its own, a testament to the mysteries that surrounded the Enders. The Dravian witches ahead of Wolf started chanting in harmony, their dances began to synchronize, swaying in time to each other in an undulating wave, while Wolf slowly trailed behind them. As they reached the front line, a crack like that of a nearby lightning strike tore from the witch's direction, and they lifted their hands towards the sky. The midday sun seemed to intensify at the direction of their outstretched palms, and unearthly spiritual trumpets blared. The Dravian soldiers, upon hearing the trumpets, parted, leaving an opening onto the field of death. The witches filled the gap immediately and began sprinting towards their enemy. Wolf followed at a slow jog after them. The witches in the back of the group began to fall, exhausted, leaving only the two in the front remaining. When the two of them were about ten feet away from the first almond, they held up their hands and let out an unnatural, guttural scream as a massive ball of greasy orange fire rolled away from their outstretched hands. After rolling another ten feet, it dissipated in a screen of smoke. The two witches collapsed immediately. All of their energy, all of the group's energy spent on that one attack, Wolf didn't waste the opening as he followed the murder ball onto the almond front line. His leather arm protector sizzled and popped until they exploded in a miniature fireball of their own. A fiery chain of supernaturally molten metal fell away from his exposed skin, seemingly running out of the tattoos on his forearms. He swung them in a large arc in front of himself. They whistled as they sailed through the air and popped like a whip crack as he stopped them. Almond soldiers were eviscerated, limbs were lost, but there was no blood, just smoldering corpses. Blood-curdling screams echoed, and Alma held what was left of his arm, as the heavy metal armor still smoldered. No protective equipment, save for another Ender's weapon, could withstand the chains. The stakes of this war weighed heavily on the minds of the Dravians. If Alma were to emerge victorious, the outcome would be a grim one, enslavement, and the brutal subjugation of their people. To the Dravians, Wolf's role as an Ender was the last beacon of hope in these dark times. As the sounds of battle intensified, the Dravians clung to the fragile hope that their champion could defy the odds. They revered Wolf as a deity of war, yet they remained cautious. They recognized the volatile nature of the Enders, whose power, while awe-inspiring, were equally destructive. Wolf slowly stalked forward towards the soldiers of Amma, like a starving animal licking its lips at the anticipation of a kill. 
The almonds panicked, breaking rank, and they ran, trying to push through their comrades. The hungry wolf seized the opening like a throat. He ran out the back of one of the retreating soldiers and jumped. He swung the chains high above his head and brought them down forcefully in front of himself, arcing them to his sides before they grazed the ground. As his feet touched the sand, he snapped one of the chains to the front and the other behind himself, then he swept them back to his sides. He didn't follow the path of the arcing chains with his eyes, confident in his practice motions of killing. He deafened himself to his enemy's cries. The tattoos on his arms began to turn the same supernatural color of the chains he wielded. It was known among the Dravians that an Ender's weapon and their tattoos were intricately linked to their past lives. The memories they unlocked were not just a source of power, but also a double-edged sword. Enders who pushed too far risked activating the dreaded Ender Curse, a cataclysmic explosion that could bring devastation to both friend and foe. With every battle, every surge of power, the danger grew like a tempest gathering on the horizon. A monstrous bull-like creature gored its way through the retreating soldiers in front of Wolf. It turned its large one-horned, one-eyed face towards him. Its pink skin glistened with sweat. It opened its meaty lips and spewed a yellow noxious cloud out through its far too human-like teeth. It roared at him, and in response, he snapped his right hand out at the monster, sending the chain whipping through its eye and out the left side of its head. It screamed a high-pitched squeal in pain and charged. Wolf took a couple steps forward, then sidestepped to the left. He turned and cracked the chains in an X as a creature whizzed past him. It collapsed in a heap, headless, as he turned back towards the almond force. The poor beast had bought them enough time to regroup. They stood in their standard shield wall formation, spears outstretched awaiting a careless strike. He paced back and forth along the wall, just out of reach of the spears, just out of reach of his chains. Those shields would not save them from him. Those spears, though, complicated his task. Adding to the difficulty, they almost now appeared somewhat more confident than they had just moments earlier. As the sun cast long shadows over the field, Wolf stilled himself. He knew the risks, understood the consequences, and yet he pressed on. He was a symbol of defiance, a living embodiment of hope in the face of his countrymen's despair. As the sun reached its zenith, the almond force had closed around Wolf. In an attempt to catch up to him, the Dravian soldiers desperately tried to push forward into the breach he had created. Almond shields formed a wall around him, spear tips aimed at his arms and legs as he continued to pace. A palpable tension radiated from the men. Wolf broke it by taking a final, deep, contemplative breath. The metal bar sprung toward him. He deftly danced between the spears, making his way towards the group of soldiers behind him, the group that separated him from his countrymen. He coiled the chains around his arms as he moved, smacking the spear shafts in between wrapping links around his forearms, careful not to touch his face in the process. Only his arms were immune to the ender weapon, and he didn't want to ruin what little protection the steel mass offered. As he closed the distance between him and them, some of the almonds faltered again and panicked into the rushing Dravian forces. Others remembered their training, though. They dropped their shields and destroyed spears as they drew the short swords on their hips. They attempted to encircle him once more, trying to capitalize on the tight quarters he had willingly provided them. But he lashed out, striking their swords away with coiled chains like an animal cornered. Some of the strikes found purchase between the coils on his arms as he deflected the blows. The almond swords began to glow a hellish reddish orange. Blood and molten metal splattered the sands in the flurry, neither group wanting to relinquish an inch, for it meant death. Wolf's memories of this unforgiving land were etched into the very core of his being, intertwined with the memories of his past lives. As he stepped closer to death, he felt the weight of those memories pressing upon him, urging him onward. The chains that adorned his arms rattled softly, as if in anticipation of the battle still to come. The briar symbol on his shoulder flared to life. It pulsed with a quiet energy, a promise of the sweet power that it carried with it, as it melted through the concealing ink, then through his protective vest. The chains across his body lit up like the coals of a smith's furnace. The thick concealing ink billowed off of him in a black cloud like steam from water dropped on a red-hot stone. The vest fell off of him, completely slagged. His sandals melted into a pool. His shin armor warped in spots and his pants threatened to split. The only thing that remained unmarred was the mask. He didn't notice. One of the almonds, shocked at the sudden transformation, dropped his guard and Wolf pounced, striking the poor man straight in the face with his chain-wrapped right hand. He averted his eyes as he pulled his hand back as fast as he could. It came free easily with a sickening plop noise. He used the opportunity to try and shake the coiled chains loose on that arm as he relaxed his grip on the chain. The almonds took a second to decide if this fight was one they needed as the scrambling Dravians closed on their flank. Wolf knew he didn't have a choice but to press them now, before he took a spear to the back. He lashed his right arm out, freeing the chain. It spun in a spiral in front of his outstretched palm. He swept it sideways, cutting down two of the three men to his right. 
The three to his left acted as if they would strike out, but he raised his left hand defensively, and they balked. The surviving man on his right didn't wait. He tipped under the chain and sprung forward like a snake. His short sword clenched tight in a thrust. Woof. His attention divided, dodged a blow a little too late. The sharpened metal skimmed across the exposed surface of his ribcage, leaving a profuse gash. Wolf growled and dropped his arm, hitting the man on the crown of his head with his elbow, making him stumble forward onto his knees. A sharp pain raced through his right arm, as the sensation of knocking his elbow against a metal helm traced its way up. He shook his left hand free of the coils as he turned in place, lifting and spinning the chain on his right arm. One of the men, still standing off to his right now, let out a shrill cry, and he threw the short sword at Wolf, who blocked it deftly with his left arm. The man didn't wait to see if the sword made contact before he turned and ran towards the almond camp. Wolf ceased spinning the chain, allowing its momentum to ensnare the fleeing soldier. He screamed in pain as the chain seared everything it touched, melting through flesh and metal alike. The scream was silenced quickly as Wolf pulled the chain tight. The group of almonds that had been pressing his back watched as the man fell apart, unable to do anything for him. They stopped abruptly, queasy at the sight. Wolf understood the feeling. He was sick with the visceral horror of it all once before, a lifetime ago. He had seen the image play out a thousand times through dozens of different eyes now. The three remaining almonds, now behind him, were swallowed by the pitched Dravian soldiers as they converged on Wolf. The cacophony of war echoed through the desert, a restless chaos that gripped him like a siren song. Each step he took brought him closer to the heart of the conflict. Amidst a sea of combatants, Wolf was a solitary figure, his chains and the briar symbol on his shoulder marking him with a radiant orange light. Lalandra, a young witch from the nomadic tribe of Isla Roar, watched the conflict unfold with a mixture of awe and trepidation. She watched from the back lines, recovering her strength, resting after her summons. Her keen eyes took in the intricate dance of combat, the interplay of strategy, and the chaos that defined this theater of war. She knew that the fate of nations hung in the balance, and the outcome of this day would reverberate through history like an echoing thunderclap. For Lalandra, this was not just a battle. It was a chance to test her abilities as a witch. Her life frame belied the immense power she possessed. The desert winds whispered secrets to her and the very sand seemed to respond to her command. With a wave of her hand, she could call forth the elements, shaping them into deadly weapons or protective barriers. She was the strongest of her tribe, but she knew she wasn't the strongest witch of this wartime conclave. She was eager to test her skills against the ones in Alma who called themselves mages. A sacred title among Dravia, to them it meant those who mastered the elements. As she observed Wolf, her eyes narrowed with a mix of curiosity and disgust. She had heard tales of his prowess, the legendary Ender who had risen from the pits to become a living symbol. She also knew the risk that came with such power, the temptation to push too far, to unleash the full force of one's abilities. Right now, he looked like a dog who had slipped their leash. The battle raged, an unyielding tempest of violence and desperation. With each passing moment, the sand shifted, and the outcome remained uncertain. Wolf, his chains in motion, wove a lethal tapestry of strikes and counterattacks. His movements were at first, a delicate balance between restraint and carelessness. Now, exhaustion setting in, his movements were slowed. He erratically pushed deeper into the enemy line. As the sun cast long looming shadows on the horizon, the ender lit up like a beacon, drawing the eyes of friend and foe. As he crashed once again into the almond line, the lander watched horrified. Is, is he insane? Does he want to die? She said in a disgruntled whisper as she pulled her long black hair back. She donned her mystic's veil, covering her face in a colorful purple shawl, the color of her tribe, Isla Roar. She took a couple of deep breaths, hoping that her strength had returned. Then she stood. Amidst the chaos, a sense of anticipation hung in the air. Marcus Valoris, a royal guard for Solomon, the king of Alma, was a man of imposing build and dense, lean muscle. His armor adorned with intricate gold filigree and the symbols of Alma. He watched the unfolding battle with a growing mix of frustration and respect for the Dravian champion. Solomon's presence on the battlefield was unmistakable as he and his gold-clad guard pushed their way to the front line. He led the almond forces with the authority of a king and the ferocity of an ender, his fiery sword and shield lighting up the night as he carved his way towards Wolf. His people revered him for the prosperity he had brought to Alma, despite how the kingdom typically felt about enders. But in this moment, he was a warrior first and foremost, the conqueror king. He took his throne, then the neighboring nation, and then that title. The clash of Wolf and Solomon was inevitable. Their eyes were pulled to each other's silhouettes, highlighted by their unearthly weapons. Men, with me, to victory, shouted the king of Alma. My lord, 
Are you sure this is a wise idea? shouted Marcus to his king, trying to pierce the din of battle. Valerie Temes, another of the king's royal guards, a large woman who dwarfed both her king and Marcus, grabbed Solomon's arm, halting him in place. She was careful not to touch the shield he brandished, as she spun him to face her easily, for it would burn her as surely as any other Ender's weapon. He pulled free of her grip and gave her a chastising glare as he said, Dear Valerie, Marcus, I know it's your job, but you can't save me from my duties, my responsibilities. Solomon returned his gaze to the Dravian line. His men now rushed past him to engage the enemy, eager to claim glory for their king. Wolf, his chain still in motion, saw the fresh soldiers approaching the line, backed by their ender king. He felt the fight leaving his body with each swing, but he knew he was needed now more than ever. A fury overtook him, a burning furnace of wrath that threatened to melt everything he was, his loyalty, his pride, his strength. Flashes of memories not his own flooded him. His vision turned red and tunneled. A beat like a war drum pounded in his ears. He fought against the flood and fury, pulling the chains tight on the monster inside himself. It roared, and he realized he was flying through the air, chains lashing and thrashing as he sailed. The monster's roar was one born from his own throat. Lelander watched in horror with the group of witches she had rallied to her, as she struggled to reach Wolf. She had come to pull him from the fray before her worst fears became a reality. The shifting throng of densely packed soldiers, swaying back and forth in a desperate bid for survival, made moving towards the man an impossible task. The journey was made all the more difficult by his newest erratic behavior. The Dravians that had recently come to his rescue now retreated away from him. The soft glow of his tattoos were now a raging inferno. She watched helplessly as it spread across his body, like the tentacles of some hellish beast. She had to reach him soon. Will snarled and growled, snapping the chains back to himself. They made an audible sizzling sound as they hit his palms, as if the skin now burned hotter than the chains themselves. He roared again and spun like a top, releasing the chains. He danced like one of the witches across the armor of the dead, the chains whipping through the darkness, leaving tracers of light. Those almonds that had just rallied now broke under the onslaught of this hellfire beast, who left a trail of smoldering armor and ash behind it. The Almond King knew before he stepped foot onto this wretched land that he would have to be the one to kill the Dravian Ender. Solomon walked purposely and calmly towards the clash that would define this battle, perhaps this war. The eyes of the two formidable Enders, Wolf and Solomon, locked onto each other across the battlefield. It was a moment of silent acknowledgement, a recognition of destiny's call. Both champions were bound by their abilities, their roles as warriors, and the weight of their respective nations. Solomon's armor gleamed in the harsh light cast by his Ender weapons. The kingdom of Alma had flourished under his rule, even it had come at the cost of war and conquest. Solomon moved towards Wolf, his sword and shield in hand. He did so with the confidence of a man who had never known defeat. He was a king in both title and action, and his very presence on the battlefield inspired his troops. His gold-clad guard moved in tandem with their king. Wolf, on the other hand, was defiance, a living embodiment of hope. His chains whirled through the air as he continued his reckless dance forward until none but Solomon and his guard stood before him. Solomon recognized Wolf for what he was, a relentless predator, one that had been backed into a corner. Cuts and gashes marred the Ender's body, a broken arrow protruded from the man's unarmored shoulder. The mask he wore was stained with blood, deep scratches cratered its surface. He gave Solomon a malevolent, smoldering glare, filled with the promise of violence. Solomon understood why his men had fled. There would be no punishments later. He waved his guard away as he approached. They would pose more a hindrance than help for this fight. As Wolf and Solomon closed the distance between them, the battlefield seemed to hold its breath, as if nature itself recognized the significance of this encounter. Solomon raised his sword, its blade gleaming like a shard of sunlight. Wolf tightened his grip on the chains as he took two drunken steps before jumping at Solomon with a snarl. Solomon took the blow from the twisting chain easily with his shield, parrying the other with his sword. The clash of the two weapons reverberated through the desert, a symphony. Each meeting of the weapon came with a loud ringing noise, like that of a tuning fork. A chorus of echoes greeted them back. The battlefield had fallen still, the screams of war silent among the melody. It was as if the weapons were meant for this, to meet each other in battle. Perhaps every eye had been drawn to the two warriors, or perhaps the unnaturally beautiful sound simply drowned the noise out. Either way, this was one of the things Lelandra had feared most. Within the momentary stillness, she saw an opening through the crowd. 
She shoved through her own allies. Her small coven snapped out of their reverie, her movements waking those around her. The fight seemed to come roaring back to life with a sudden scream. Solomon's shield became a bulwark against Wolf's relentless assault. Each strike, each swing of the chains, was met with an unwavering defense. As the duel continued, both warriors burned with an intensity. The air around them shimmered like the heat off a midday dune. Sweat dripped down their brows and puffed away in an instant. Neither of the men seemed to notice, focused as they were on killing the other. Solomon knew time was on his side as he watched Wolf fumble, barely able to dodge a blow from his short sword in time. But he also knew the sickly sweet temptation of the inner power, how it always wanted more. How you wanted to give it more, to delve deeper into it, to fill those memories, that power, course through you. A desperate man might just do that, ending both their lives and his aspirations. He had to end this quickly before that could happen. Each strike, each parry, Solomon the King of Alma defended with a proficiency born of years of training and experience. His red-hot kite shield, which had become the new emblem of his kingdom, held firm against Wolf's furious attacks. With each swing of his sword, he sought to breach Wolf's defenses, to exploit any weakness in the Dravian champion's assault. Wolf, on the other hand, fought with a wavering resolve. The chains that adorned his arms whirled through the air with lagging precision, each strike probing Solomon's defenses. He tried to end the duel while slipping in and out of control. A slave again, this time to the memories. His body moved on its own to the practice motions in his head. He felt like he was falling into the molten core of himself. Marcus watched the battle unfold. He knew the stakes were high, and the outcome of this duel would determine the course of the conflict. His loyalty to Solomon ran deep, and he respected him for his unwavering courage, but he couldn't help but believe his king was risking too much. Valerie stood by, her large and muscular frame, an imposing figure among the guard. She too admired Solomon, even if he angered her at times. The man didn't have the disposition of a king or a general in times like these. He would rather risk his life on the front line. She watched a duel like a hawk, hoping she wouldn't have to interject, but prepared to do so if she saw her king begin to lose. With each passing moment, the outcome became more certain. The battlefield was a cauldron of chaos and violence, enderlights thrashing about like a wildfire. The sun had long since faded to shadows, but from across the battlefield, Wolf shone like it, his tattoo burning blindingly. The chains, spreading, seemed to pulse with anticipation. Wolf bashed against the shield trying to overpower Solomon. Solomon pulled himself behind it, putting his weight into it as he pushed forward with a roar. Wolf slapped the sand at the Almond King's feet with his chains, forcing Solomon back into a defensive position. He bounced on his heels a few steps back from Solomon. The chains fell limp to his sides as he stopped his dance of death. A brief moment of clarity had come to him, and he seized it. The Almond King watched Wolf, expecting a sudden return to battle. The burning chain-link tattoos couldn't hide the dried blood, sweat, and caked dirt that coated the champion's skin, nor could it hide his ragged breasts. His arms hung limp at his side, shaking with exhaustion. If this was a trick, Solomon did not intend to fall for it. He waited patiently. Wolf, with a loud sigh, walked forward slowly, his legs unsteady. He gripped his chains in his hands again, tightly. Then he charged Solomon, swinging the chain in his right hand in a downward arc. Solomon blocked the chain easily with the shield in his left hand. Wolf swung the chain in his left hand horizontally. Solomon parried it with the sword. Then he spun the short sword, wrapping the chain around it. Solomon jabbed the tangled sword into the ground, pinning the chain. He didn't release the sword's handle as he lifted the shield, anticipating a strike. Wolf pulled on the chain, but it didn't budge under the weight of Solomon's sword. He thought to strike with his right hand, but he saw Solomon's shield raised, and he knew the strike would never reach him. So he charged instead, wrapping the chain around his arm as he ran. Solomon was surprised he would charge. When he stepped within five feet of Solomon, he released the sword handle, freeing the chain as the sword whooshed from existence. He shifted his position and swung the shield horizontally in front of him. Wolf, off balance by Solomon's sudden shift, tried to dip below it. He slid across the sand, his legs parted trying to get as low as possible. His neck craned as the strike slid across the right side of the mask. The leather strap snapped, and it fell off as the shield sliced off Wolf's right ear. Wolf, off balance and in pain, with no leverage swung the coiled chain on his right hand into Solomon's chest. The swing had no power behind it, but it still made Solomon stumble backwards a step. 
melting a hole in his armor. Gritting, Solomon swung his right hand out at Wolf, and the short sword flashed back into it. Wolf rolled backwards, away from the blade, snapping the chain in his left hand up weakly in defense. Solomon beat the chain away with the sword, then he put the shield down and charged. Wolf tried to roll onto his feet, but his tired legs were uncooperative. He managed to find his feet just as Solomon reached him, lifting his right hand still coiled in the chain up in defense. Solomon slammed into him with the shield, pushing Wolf backwards. Wolf tried to push back with his right arm as the superheated shield blistered the arm underneath the chains, but Solomon had too much weight and power behind the shield. Solomon lifted the sword in his right hand up, leveling it with Wolf's neck over the shield. Wolf saw the strike coming the moment before he struck, and he caught the sword with the chain in his left hand, catching it between the links, pinning it. Solomon tried to muscle the sword, and it inched forward. Wolf spun the chain in his left hand, tying the blade up further. He pulled tight, and the blade locked. Solomon saw the pointlessness of pushing the blade further, so instead he pushed the shield. Wolf desperately tried not to lose his balance as he held the blade and pushed against the shield. Solomon began to pull the blade back, taking Wolf's chain with it. Wolf slipped and the shield suddenly hopped up, pressing against his face. The chains on his arm pressed against his chest. Wolf roared an ethereal howl of agony as the shield pressed into the right side of his face, momentarily catching his skin ablaze before melting it off with a horrific sizzle. His bright eye made a terrible popping noise as it exploded under the heat. Lelander watched the duel between Wolf and Solomon rage on as she struggled through the dense front line. The battlefield, an unforgiving expanse of dust, darkness, and shifting bodies stretched out before her. The fate of nations hung in the balance, and yet, her current opposition was only the darkness of the night and her fellow countrymen. She screamed, punched, and wriggled her way through the men, all while trying not to trip over them in the black. It sounded like she was having more luck than the witches that followed her, but she didn't dare turn to look. She was distracted enough watching the Enders fight in between shoving her way towards them. The desert winds whipped up the sand and gently whispered an unintelligible dimmer note. Lelandra realized the crowd had stilled once more, tension pinning them in place, and she looked up at the Enders once again, terrified of what she might see. The two men were locked in a vicious grapple, vying for supremacy, and she knew it was only a matter of time before Wolf slipped, trying to hold himself upright. Solomon pushed into him, and Wolf screamed in pain. A bright flare of light winked in and out of existence, as whatever part of Wolf had been touched momentarily burst into flames. Lelandra found herself screaming with him. Has this all been pointless? No. She wouldn't let it end like this. Not before she even had a chance to really test herself. She turned her scream into an echo of the desert's whisper, and gave it power. The solemn note pushed through the crowd of men, parting them before her. Before she realized it, she was running through them, cursing every bad word she knew, while she summoned a ball of electric energy between her hands. This was a bad idea. The small ball whirred in her hands. She separated them, aiming her right hand out. She screamed as she extended her index and middle finger. The ball transformed into a spiral that chased at the outside of her hand, starting from her palm. It shot out of her fingers like the bolt of a crossbow. It was weak, raw. She hadn't formed it properly. She simply didn't have time. The ball arced towards Solomon as Lelandra mentally prepared her next spell. A hulking woman of a guard stepped from the shadows, pulling Solomon back like he was a fighting puppy. The ball lazily sailed by the two of them. Wolf for a moment was dragged with Solomon. As he sagged to the ground, the chains on his wrists disappeared. The supernatural marks on his body pulsed meagerly a few times, then went dark. Before Lelandra could muster her next attack, one of the Dravian soldiers cursed loudly as he threw a javelin at Solomon. One of Solomon's gold and white clad guards batted away with a mace as he stepped in front of Solomon, raising a large tower shield. Lelandra knew she only had moments as Solomon's guard moved forward to ring him. The guard in front of Solomon stepped forward. He raised his mace high. His eyes narrowed at Lelandra, then he turned to Wolf, motionless on the ground. The man swung the mace down in an arc towards Wolf's head. Lelandra was ready, though she had changed the spell at the last second, so it lost some power. The sonic shockwave she had summoned earlier had given her an idea, so she refined it this time and narrowed it. Instead of a scream or a sad note, it came out as a high-pitched whistle, visibly moving through the air. It hit the guard square in the center of his tower shield. 
Even with the loss of power, the shield crumpled under the impact. The man went flying backwards into Solomon and the other giant guard. She had chosen the spell in hopes of not hurting Wolf, more than he already was, if he was even alive still. She wasn't sure she had accomplished her goal. She moved forward trying to reach him, but another one of Solomon's guards rushed at her. Valerie was at a loss for words as she watched a slender dravity in which tossed Marcus in his full set of war armor like he was a rag doll. She tried to move in front of Solomon to catch him. Solomon quickly extinguished his weapons and tried to escape. Valerie had to settle for catching Solomon and Marcus as Marcus slammed into Solomon, knocking him off his feet. She looked up, hoping the surprisingly capable young woman wasn't still in pursuit and was relieved to find that she was now in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with another of the guards. Guards, form a wall, she shouted as she helped the two men regain their feet. Solomon was quick to recover, pulling his weapons back into existence as the guards started to form around them. Willandra had managed to get the guard to drop his weapon and shield through the clever use of heat waves nudged by some magic. In doing so, the guard must have figured out that it was her swaying motions that shaped the magic. Now he pressed her harder, making sure she was always defensively stepping away from him. She wasn't a trained hand-to-hand -hand fighter. She wasn't even a fighter. He struck out at her, aiming his gauntleted hand at her face. She backed away from it, but he caught her wrist with his other hand. He pulled her towards him as he swung again. She tried to move out of the way, but the metal-covered hand caught her in the left cheek, snapping her head back violently and splitting her lip. Little stars spun in her narrowing vision as she felt the metal fingertips clutch around her throat, squeezing tight. She coughed, or tried to, panicking as she punched and kicked. Her hands and feet bounced off the man's armor like a child's fit. She felt at the hand, pulled at it, trying to loosen its grip. A moment of calm washed over her as her vision faded. Lander put her hand on the man's forearm, unable to hold onto his arm. She let it lay limp, palm down. Then she let the raw, unfiltered magic run through her. An electric current ran out in response. It traced through the guard's armor, then back to her. Both of them spasmed uncontrollably at the mercy of the magic. She tried to cut it off and realized she already had. As the current continued its path, she blacked out. Valerie watched the situation devolve in moments. The Dravian army now charged once again over their fallen champion. The guard pushed them back as fresh almond troops flooded in. The field had become utter chaos. The only still place in this hurricane lay within the circle the guard provided their king. Valerie knew her king wouldn't let that last for long, as he stood a mere meter from the guards in front of him. Solomon gave her a slight glance over his shoulder. His eyes betrayed nothing of his intent. Perhaps he wanted to make sure she was still there, or perhaps he read her mind. He said something she couldn't make out, and the guards moved aside for him. He pulled his shield up and marched forward, peeking over the top of the fearsome ender weapon as he moved, lashing out with the short sword at anyone unfortunate enough to be in his path. The King of Alma fought with a controlled precision that spoke of his years of training and experience. His shield was formidable, an unyielding defense and a devastating weapon. He pushed through the Dravians, scattering the group in front of the guards with an unsettling ease. They tried to slip under, over, or to the side of the shield, but were met with curt responses from the short sword. They tried to fall back, to find some room to breathe as almond soldiers poured over them. Lelander awoke in a stupor, a ringing piercing in her ears. She sat on her knees. The guard she had been fighting slumped across from her. His hands still weakly clung onto her neck. She was surrounded by Dravian soldiers, some pushing past her and the guard. Others frantically tried to move out of the way, retreating. She slapped the guard's hand off her neck and he let out a weak moan. She ignored him. She had bigger problems. She couldn't see Solomon or his guard from her hands and knees, but she knew he was close. The flashes of light and the smell of burning bodies gave away his presence. The screams of her countrymen gave a more precise location. She scanned the ground, hoping to find Wolf before he did. A hand grasped her shoulder and she spun around, almost screaming in panic. It was one of the older witches. She had talked into taking on this doomed mission. The woman was dressed in the royal red colors, signifying her as a capital witch. Her kind eyes looked Lelander up and down behind her veil. As she appraised her condition, she said in a creaky voice, My, my, girl, we've been looking for you everywhere. Lelander looked behind the older woman to see the makeshift coven she had formed. Marcus watched the battle in frustration as he stood behind the royal guards. The tiny Dravian witch had essentially made it pointless for him to be on the battlefield anymore. 
His left arm hung limp at his side, his large tower shield long since abandoned. She had probably managed to crack a few of his ribs too. He clutched his mates tight as his gaze snapped back and forth between Valerie, Solomon, and the guard who had stepped in to take his place. Valerie stood a step behind Solomon to his right, her large armored frame shifting back and forth. She barely moved when she slapped her large tower shield down, blocking her king's flanks. She let the shield and her heavy armor do most of the fighting for her as she jabbed out with her short spear, like one would a toothpick into an olive. The guard on Solomon's left didn't fare as well. His nervousness of Solomon's shield was evident, as he warily stepped away when the king moved. Marcus cursed his failure. He should be the one there, and if his king ended up hurt, he would never forgive himself. He wouldn't make the same mistake again. A gentle song slithered through the battlefield. The hairs on Marcus's neck stood on end and he had the overwhelming urge to run to his king, to jump in front of him. A boom sounded, like the crashing of rocks from a cliff face. A large puff of sand shot into the air and men screamed. Marcus ran as fear made him give in to the urge. He ran toward his king, towards the screaming. A swirling whirlpool of sand greedily snatched at soldiers, almond and dravian alike. Men disappeared beneath its surface, devoured by the fine granules. Valerie sat anchored on the outside of it. She held Solomon up. His feet were being pulled towards the center. Valerie struggled against the current, but all she could do was manage to not be pulled in further. Marcus ran to them. He tried to reach them with his good arm, but had no leverage to pull them in. Valerie looked at him. She said nothing. The look of her eyes said it all. He snarled at her unspoken refusal. He dug himself into the sand with his good hand and his legs. He stretched out his ruined arm. She grabbed it without hesitation, pulling her massive frame and Solomon forward. His arm popped and cracked. The arm stretched weirdly and he wondered if it would be ripped off as he faded in and out of consciousness. He barely registered it when she let go of his arm as she stepped from the sandy pit. Dravian horns sounded, marking their retreat. Solomon watched them run into the darkness. As his men moved to pursue, he motioned to Valerie. She nodded gave Marcus an installing pat on the back, and then pulled a horn from the bag on her waist. She sounded it, giving the signal to retreat. Even if we didn't gain any ground today, Solomon thought, this was surely a victory. Solomon sat at a large wooden table, in his lavish tent surrounded by utilitarian opulence. He preferred function over form for most occasions. He wouldn't even wear his gaudy gold and white royal armor if he had a choice. He was fine with the leather tunic of his youth back when he was a simple farmer. But he knew that his station required a bit more... pomp. He couldn't complain. He chose this long ago. When he awakened, he was just a child living in a remote almond farming village. He hid it from his family, knowing how almonds viewed Enders historically. He trained himself day and night, even back then, knowing he would one day attempt to overthrow the king. He worked towards that goal since the beginning of his awakening. He joined the army, then the royal guard, to one day challenge the king face to face. The Almond Kingdom wasn't his end goal, though. No, he wanted all of the eastern portion of the continent, to establish the biggest kingdom in history, a flourishing one that lasted hundreds of years, one that could become the center of trade and culture throughout the world, and an Ender would build it. He knew he didn't have much time to do that. Enders were famous for multiple things, one of which was their short lifespans and catastrophic deaths. Forced drafts, slavery, destroying cities, all of it was a small price to pay to accomplish that goal. Aside from that, for Enders, there was no heaven or hell. He snapped the book he was reading closed and set it on the table next to a stack of them. He was researching the chain tattoo, more specifically, an Ender named Thorn. He gleaned more from his stolen memories than he had from any of these books. Apparently, the chain weapons were a running theme through his past lives as well but that was about all he had learned. No tactics or strategies. No history he could exploit. He wondered why the Dravia bothered to hide who he was as well as they did if there was no information on the Ender to be found anyway. He supposed it was a moot point. If Wolf wasn't dead, he was surely too weak to do anything. He wouldn't have been surprised to hear an explosion ring out from the Dravian camp, caused, no doubt, by an out-of-control Ender it was late morning, his men had taken the field already, he thought to perhaps join them. He looked at the ostentatious armor on its rack, and sighed. It was times like this he wished he had a squire.
Lelandra rolled out of her borrowed bedroll groggily to an increasingly warming morning. Her muscles felt like little needles were buried in them. She coughed, her throat sore and bruised, a deep purple. Her cheek and lip were swollen in an angry red. She had collapsed into the blankets near a campfire late last night after returning from the battlefield with Wolf's body. She was unsure if they had saved him, exhausted as she was when she and the small coven pulled him from the sands. Several other coven members had settled around the campfire last night after they had dropped the ender off in his tent. They were nowhere to be seen now. All the blankets lay abandoned around her. She tried to slough off the weariness as she prepared for the rough day ahead. She left the blankets lying there as the others had. Before she returned to the mage's line, she had a stop to make. With a heavy heart, Lalandra stilled herself as she walked towards the ender's tent. The guards still ringed it. They seemed off somehow. Less aware. Less alert. She walked up to the guard in front of the tent's entrance flap. He looked at her, their eyes meeting briefly. He motioned her entirely. She had no recollection of the man, but she supposed they had met last night. A woman in her late twenties with short brown hair sat behind a large table. Dirty tear stains painted her face, her large brown eyes puffy and bright. On the table lay Wolf, taking deep, ragged breaths. Three healers ran circles around him, their features obscured behind the thick cloth aprons and masks. They dipped gauze in liquids and smeared them onto the open wounds. She gave a momentary look around the room, trying to find a spot to stand out of their way. She was shocked to see more of the small coven there. Apparently, she wasn't the only one who was curious. What surprised her more was the fact that only a singular, unarmed guard was in the room. He stood next to the sitting woman, almost as if he was guarding her. Her still collar and simple clothes clashed with the guard's presence. Moving out of the way, Lelandra stood next to one of the coven girls. She looked at Lelandra as if she wanted to say something, but no words came out of her opening and closing mouth. They both turned their attention to the healers and the ender. The witches were useless here. No magic could heal wounds caused by an ender's weapon. They had to rely on bandages and disinfectants now. The ender was in rough shape. The right side of his face was a black lump. Charred bone poked through the flaky skin. His cheek was gone. Black and teeth were visible in its place. His ear had been cleanly shaved off. The hair on that side burned. The left side still hung in his battle braids. A cavernous hole leaked green-red liquid where his eyes should have been. His abdomen was a mix of yellows and reds with large boils running up it. Chain marks seared his flesh. Interestingly, the tattoos broke the burns on his chest up, as if they protected him from his own chains. Wolf found himself spinning. He felt weightless like he was underwater. He tried to open his eyes, but everything remained black. He panicked and tried to scream. Silence. Stillness permeated the darkness. Suddenly, streaks of silent red and orange lightning shot through the darkness. They seemed to slice through the abyss towards him. He saw smiling faces he didn't recognize. People overlapped the blackness, breaking the silence with their laughter. He heard one of them say, Thorn? He sat at a table of plain, rough wood inside a small cabin made of stone and mortar. People surrounded the table. Some sat. Others stood. The small cabin didn't seem large enough to house so many people, and the table was not big enough to seat them all. He was there among them, but they seemed distant, far away from him. A gentle din of voices surrounded him, as they all smiled genuinely, and laughed heartily as they talked among themselves. For some reason, the noise comforted him. A warm, small hand touched his, and he looked at it. He was surprised to see such a dainty, soft hand, but was more so not to see the chain tattoo and all the scars. His small, dark, tan-skinned hand was now large, pale, and unblemished. He looked into the face of the one who had touched him. She was a small, delicate woman with fair skin and blonde hair. Her deep blue eyes looked into his questioningly, as she said again, Thorn? Memories ripped through him. Thorn was his name, but not his. It was given to him by his people, after, after. The memory slipped away and he saw the briar. For the first time in his life, Wolf saw the briar. He knew it existed on his left shoulder, but had never taken the time to look at it. He hadn't had a mirror in the fighting pits, and when he was taken to the capital, he would have rather spent his time learning what he wasn't able to before, namely reading and writing. The twisting thorny vines wrapped around themselves. They began to glow in ember orange and tremble, slithering into a tighter knot. Leah sat in the ender's tent on the lavish wooden chair used to write his journals. She had been up since late last night, 
fetching the healers, whatever they needed. She had been summoned when Wolf had been brought into his tent, and had arrived shortly before the witches had left it. She had been the one to move the table, with the help of Caled, the guard standing next to her. They had been the ones to place Wolf's body upon it. They were the ones who put the steel chains that bound him to the X back on. Her mind wandered to things she tried to ignore, only for her mind to wander to another dreaded subject. Her fate was tied to this man, and she couldn't help but hate him at this moment, despite her worry over him. The healers rushed back and forth. This was the third set to have come in now. She tried to pay attention to them and their actions. Her tired mind wandered and had to be prodded to stay on task. She hadn't even noticed the members of the witch's coven standing in the shadows, out of the way of the healers. Wolf's tattoo pulsed, and the healers moved away from him with audible gasps. One of them almost ended up in Leah's lap as they stumbled away. Wolf shot awake, his tattoos lighting up for a brief moment, the chains on his wrists jingling as they rattled. He pulled against them for a second before coming to his senses. He looked around the room. His gaze met the healers. He said, Out, to the healers in a curt tone. They didn't move, and he said it again, louder this time. They quickly moved to the exit, and Lalandra moved to follow them with the witches. Wolf stopped them with an outstretched hand. He said, sit, as he motioned to his chairs and bed. He motioned Leo over to him as he slid over to the edge of the table. She stood quickly, but walked over to him meekly. As she reached him, he motioned to his face and burnt abdomen and said, softly, can you bandage these? She recoiled for a moment at the request and nodded in acquiescence. He looked towards the guard and said, can you fetch gold mass for me? The guard looked as if he would protest, but he left without a word. He looked next to Lalandra, his good eyes serious and somber. In obvious pain, he shifted his weight so he could face her. I need your help, he said. He waited until Leah was done bandaging him. Then he asked her to get him some supplies, before he continued his conversation with Lalandra. Gold Mask entered the tent with a little fanfare. The way he carried himself spoke of a certain fear. Lalandra wondered if the priest sought the Ender meant to kill him as a last act of revenge for keeping him chained for the majority of his life. A tired guard and another from outside the tent entered with him. The tired guard now had a short scimitar strapped to his waist. Wolf eyed the man in the golden mask, his eyes slipping to Lalandra, then back to the man. She began to steeple her hands in anticipation of casting a spell. Gold mask stepped forward, towards Wolf. His guards followed, stepping next to her. I have a plan, Wolf said bluntly. The man in the golden mask turned his head, questioningly. Well, out with it then. I don't know how, even you, could salvage this, the man said sternly. Wolf nodded his bandaged head toward the guards flanking him. I don't know if we should include everyone, he said. Gold mask flicked his wrist, and the guards left the tent. He motioned to the witches, looking at their uncovered faces. And them? The man in the golden mask said. Wolf replied, they are part of the plan. Khaled al Khuri stood outside the tent's entrance, his palm resting on his short sword. He didn't think he would need it, but he kept his hand on it all the same, mainly to keep himself awake. Last night was restless and traumatic for Leah and him both. He hadn't managed to get any rest since he was rudely awakened. As the main guard who had kept Wolf imprisoned, he had grown to respect him despite their roles. It was a complex relationship, one born of necessity and forged in their circumstances. Caled had a loyalty to his kingdom and his duty as a guard, but there was an unspoken understanding between the two of them. They both recognized the harsh realities of their world, the compromises they had to make to survive. In the midst of all the violence, Wolf had treated him with nothing but kindness. He knew that one day the Ender would die a horrible, violent death, but he had never expected to see the results firsthand. He couldn't help but wish he had the key to set him free, to scream at him to run, but a piece of him knew there would be no escape for the doomed man. Caleb saw Leah walking towards the tent. A big bag was slung over the woman's shoulder. She carried a large platter of food. When the Ender asked him to fetch Gold Mask, he thought that the man had meant to return to the battle. This confirmed it. Caleb met her at the tent flap. Their exchange was brief, their words laced with unspoken emotions. Gold Mask exited the tent. He said nothing as he drifted into the shadows of the camp. Sinking back to his cabal of neophytes, Caled watched the man leave. Perplexed at his exit, he neither gave Leah or him leave to enter the tent. He hesitated for a moment before pulling the flap open. 
A young witch greeted him by practically pulling him into the tent, her soft touch and delicate features at odds with the bruises on her face and neck. Something burned in her dark eyes that Caleb was unsure of. Conviction? No. Sadness, maybe. He noticed the chains were undone on Wolf's wrists. She motioned Leah in with hurried hand gestures. As Leah followed the motions into the tent, the young witch said, Finally, everybody's here. Wolf looked at Leah and said, You have them? The servant girl nodded once as she set the platter down. She slung the bag over her shoulder and handed it to him as she said, Why do you need three, God Wolf? Wolf ignored her question and set the bag down on the table next to the platter as he said, Well, Landra, were you able to get them? Well, Landra proudly said with a smirk, I told you, it wouldn't be a problem. She pulled a ring of keys from her pocket and handed them to him. Thank you. I just met you, and I think you've done more for me than anybody else in my entire life, he said as he hopped off the table. He walked towards the chest by the foot of his bed and said, You don't even follow Baal Zaha, do you? Well, Andrew seemed to consider her answer carefully amidst her current company. Wolf seemed unbothered by her delayed answer as he opened the chest and kicked the bottom. Is Laror isn't known for our religious fervor. The only higher power we admit to is the deserts, Lelandra slowly replied. Suits me fine, Wolf said, not looking up from the chest as he pulled a false bottom out of it. I never wanted anyone to worship me anyways, as a weapon, or anything else, he continued frankly. He pulled a small lockbox from the chest and threw it on the table with a thud as he walked towards his writing desk. Caleb was taken aback by the box. He had been in Wolf's transient tent for better parts of years and had never seen it. Nor did he know the chest had a false bottom. Wolf grabbed his journal off the desk, slapping the pages shut. He bound and locked it with leather straps. He threw the book at Caleb gently. It bounced in his hands in his tired state before he managed to clasp it firmly. What's this, God Wolf? Caleb said awkwardly. Wolf walked up to the table. He grabbed the lockbox and handed it to Caleb. It's the key. The key to everything of value I've managed to scrape together in my entire life. It's yours now, Wolf said as the metal box traded hands. Leah watched the exchange confused. Everything about Wolf had changed. He walked almost tenderly compared to his previous, purposeful stroll. He talked casually, when before, words seemed painful. She had known him for years and had never known how he had felt about the Baal Zaha religion that bound him to his duty as the kingdom's chosen weapon of protection. Wolf pulled the keys Lelandra handed him out again. As he walked towards Leah, he clicked through them until he found a dull, dirty silver key. He gently straightened the collar around her neck. He clicked the key in and released it. He clicked the collar shut again and threw it in an arc across the tent. It bounced across the fine carpets coming to a rest against his desk. He turned away from her wordlessly. She grabbed him from behind, pulling the short man tight into a hug as she cried silently. He touched her hand and said gently, Don't. I could have. I should have done this sooner. She let him go, overwhelmed by emotion. Overwhelmed by what this all meant to her. What this meant for him. He grabbed the bag off the table, flipping it open, and he dumped the contents. Out spilled the brightly colored mystic's veils and witch's robes Leah had collected along with a single leather corset. Wolf handed one of the witch's outfits to Leah, then another to Caleb. Better get dressed, he said. Your caravan leaves soon. He turned to look at Lelandra. Can I count on you again, he said. She replied, of course, I have a friend who is also headed back to the capital. Wolf looked at Caleb. Don't open that on the caravan. Get out of the capital as soon as you can. Alma will head there next if I can't stop them here. Head to Isleror territory if you can. Take care of her, he said. Wolf watched Lilandra lead Caleb and Leah out of the tent, dressed in the Isleror witch's finery. They were headed to a caravan headed back to the capital that he was sure was forming right now. He waited a bit before he grabbed the leather corset and witch's outfit he had prepared for himself. He looked at the two witches remaining in the tent. He said to them, Can you make sure everything is ready? I need a moment by myself. They left with nods of agreement. He looked the red veil over for a second, his attention drawn to the silver slave's collar by the writing desk. He walked over to the desk, looked at the books lined up on the back of it. He would never get the chance to read them. 
On the table lay Caleb's uniform and scimitar, Leah's dirty dress, and the empty silver platter. Wolf had insisted on stuffing Leah's bag full. The food was one of the things that went into it. He swept the uniform and the dress into his hands. He stuffed them into the still open chest and closed it. He looked around the tent that was his home when he was away from the capital, which was almost always. He knew no living person was in the room with him, but next to him stood a ghostly fair-skinned blonde-haired woman, her deep blue eyes staring, dead ahead, a faint smile on her lips. Around the room, ghostly figures laughed silently, talking among themselves with words only they could hear. They paid him no mind. He had never experienced memories of Thorne's life before now. Most of his previous lives memories he had seen involved war. They're focused almost exclusively on using the chains as a weapon. But now, he felt like the two were merging. Happy memories flooded him, much different to his own life. A happy childhood. No ender weapon in sight. No mention of them. No blood. Or the smell of burning flesh. They sang to him a sweet lullaby. He wanted to close his eyes and let the sweet dreams wash over him. He knew that meant death, and he wasn't ready yet. He fought against their embrace with his own memories. The days in the pit when he would call a child before he was sent to fight someone or something to the death. Before the name Wolf. Before the tattoo left its mark. Before the weapon. He pulled the leather corset onto himself, pulling it tight, hoping the pain would pull him back to reality. He felt nothing, his body blissfully numb. As Lilandra left the tent, she held the flap open for the guard and servant girl dressed in the vibrant purple that marked them as witches of Isla Roar. The mystic's veil covered their faces, leaving only their eyes exposed. The guards ringing the tent paid them no mind, to which she was thankful. She led them over to where Wolf had thought the caravan would be forming. She wasn't surprised to see that the Ender was right in his assumptions. Goldmask, upon hearing of the Ender's plan, formed the caravan quietly to evacuate. Lalandra saw the capital witches in their bright red clothing forming up next to a covered wagon. She had expected most of them to return to the capital on the caravan, but was surprised to see that all of them seemed to be there. She walked towards them, unsure which one was her friend. She heard the older woman giving orders before she saw her. Lalandra approached her, asking if her two young apprentices could travel with the witches. She was stubborn about it at first, but after some prodding, and Lalandra reminding her of their shared experience on the battlefield. She relented. Lalandra saw her two apprentices onto the wagon, reminding them loudly about their vow of silence, just as the two looked like they were about to say their thanks. She hurried back to the Ender's tent, not sure how they could pull off his plan, but eager to be done with it. She returned to an unexpected sight. Goldmass stood in the shadows of a tent, opposite the Ender's tent entrance. A group of neophytes huddled around him. They looked towards the tent entrance with rapt attention. She stood by a tent, trying not to catch the attention of the cultists, as witches in various colors began to form around her. This was her impromptu conclave from the other night, minus a few witches who were either evacuating or busy. Lalandra figured the two witches she left with Wolf must have gathered them, as they now stood next to her. Lalandra waited there for a moment before asking, Is this all of them? One of the girls responded, all of the ones we could find. She walked towards the tent, motioning the other witches to follow her. She cracked the tent flap open. Wolf sat on the table again, facing the entrance. He was dressed in the royal red of the capital. His small figure, when covered, looked almost feminine. Two scimitars hung on his side, breaking the illusion somewhat. She led the group into the tent. They circled around him as he hopped off the table their faces expectantly drawn to him. Thank you all for coming. And for the other night, he said. I'm not sure what all of you have heard before you agreed to come here. I'm going to let Lalandra explain the plan. But after that, if you want to back out, I won't blame you. Outside the Ender's tent, a tension ran through the driving camp as a partial retreat sounded. The Almond King had long since joined the battle. Confused soldiers left the front line as parts of the driving camp packed up to leave. Witches were told to rest and conserve their magic. The front line of the Dravian army all but crumbled under the massive weight of the Almond army. Dravian soldiers on the back line began to fall back thinking a full retreat was coming as their commanding officers ordered them back into position. 
A menagerie of colored shawls exited the Ender's tent in a loose formation, a circle. Upon seeing them, Goldmatch rushed in front of them, his neophytes falling on their hands and knees, kowtowing to the group of witches. He raised his hand and said, These faithful wish to serve you in this moment. He motioned to the huddled mass. He looked at the guard ringing the tent and raised his voice in command. You all should serve these witches in this battle too, he said to them, then continued in a fatherly voice. Go on now. Form around them. The guard was confused, unsure if they should follow the command. They traditionally never left the Ender's tent, not to protect him, but to protect the camp from him. Goldmask muttered loudly, irritated by the guard's reaction. His followers formed around the witches, forming another circle. The guard realized one at a time that the priest was, indeed, serious, and began to form around the neophytes. The man in the gold mask turned around facing the battlefield. He searched his pockets and realized his keys had vanished as he found what he was looking for, a small red horn. He looked over his shoulder at the group of witches, suspicion in his eyes. He pulled the mask off as he faced back around. He blew on the horn and a weird metallic howl echoed out of it. Every child of the desert knew the howl. It was a death sentence. The howl of Sandwos, an extra planar invasive creature that now called the desert of Dravia its home. They were more cat-like than dog, and were only called wolves because they hunted in a pack. The things were bloodthirsty hunters that needed constant calling. Their thick, dark gray skin had a nasty habit of turning blades. They also had a nasty habit of calling out to other packs. Why the priest would have a device that called out to them was beyond reckoning of the common folk. Wolf, on the other hand, could hazard a few guesses, none of which improved how he thought of the man. The witches that had been resting took the signal and began to resume casting, this time exclusively summoning magic. They pulled whatever they thought they could direct into the almond army before they lost control of it, from whatever planes they could, going for quantity over quality. The almond army had pushed the Dravian front line into the retreating back line and were pushing steadily towards the camp. Metallic ringing howls echoed across the dunes. They mixed with the screaming of the Dravian army still left on the field as they were crushed between the Almond army and the out-of-control summons. Wolf gave Lalander the signal, and she moved the ragtag group forward in time with her. Wolf tried to remain calm, but his plan was already spinning out of control. Why didn't the priest tell him about the horny plan to use to signal the witches? Why were there still so many soldiers in the camp? He was glad to have the help. But why not tell him that the neophytes and the guards were coming? He watched the masked man scuttle into the shadows, towards the caravan, and Wolf thought he might have understood the man's motives. The battlefield had become an unforgiving arena, where shield walls broke and reformed under the constant threat of monsters. Metallic howls announced the presence of the wolves as Dravian and Almond alike fell to the pony-sized, planar creatures. The unyielding sun cast down on the midday battlefield, scorching all who struggled upon it, man and monster. The wolves' native plain was one of endless sand and scorching suns. They preferred to hunt at noon, during the day's hottest hours. There was no telling how many of them ran through the battlefield, as more howls brought in more packs. They ransacked both camps, and the Dravian reserve ended up protecting the witches as they fainted, their magic spent. Soldiers tried to form up wagons and start a new evacuation. Goldmask's caravan was long gone. The chain of command had been broken on the Dravian side, and the camp started to fall apart. The front line swayed as it began to be swallowed by a sea of almond. Solomon watched the chaos, curious. He was unsure if he had broken the Dravian army, or if the threat of their ender's explosive end had. Maybe they had a falling out. Dravia was mainly independent tribes, after all. He had watched the first caravan that had left, and he recognized the colors from his research. It was the capital forces. Perhaps they were headed there to reinforce it. Either way, he considered it a bad strategy. What was left of the Gravian forces here would be crushed. He would make sure of it. He also considered calling the Fauna into the fight a losing strategy. He was sure they were also running through his camp, but thought his men were a better fight for them with their medium and heavy armor. The summoned monsters had proved to be effective, though, breaking down his men's shield walls with a sheer mass. He had to dispatch a few of them himself already. Solomon saw a group of chainmail-clad men with metal skull caps on. The large pikes and halberds they wielded were an odd sight to see among the Dravian infantry. They had a group of rabble behind them, dressed in everything from chains to discarded almond armor. They wielded borrowed or stolen weapons. A group of Dravian mages followed in their midst, 
sometimes blending into them. Their bright colored clothes added to the chaos of the rabble. He couldn't help but say aloud, interesting, as a small smile spread across his lips. Marcus stood to the left of his king, his tower shield replaced at the same time his broken arm and ribs were fixed. He heard his king's utterance. He turned his helmed head in time to see the man smile, his eyes fixed on the front line. He followed Salmont's gaze, catching a glimpse of purple in the crowd. His heart stopped, and dread filled him. His fears were confirmed. He saw the lithe mage among a group of witches. He instinctively pulled the shield in front of himself, guarding his chest. Of all of the entire Dravian force, he considered the Dravian mages the biggest threat. Even though he knew his king had their mages take precautions with their armor, even though one of those self-same mages sat behind Solomon, he looked towards the mage to confirm he was still there. A tall, skinny, older man, pale as the moon. He wore a dark black robe, the hood drawn up over his bald, pale head. He looked at Valerie next. She stood on the king's right. If she had noticed the Dravian mages, she didn't give any indication. Her solid frame still as a statue. Valerie heard Solomon. She didn't have to look at him to know he was smiling. She heard it in his voice. It didn't matter to her what the young king thought was interesting. It could have been any number of things. Her loyalty to Solomon was unwavering. She thought of him as a younger brother in need of tutelage, and she would defend him with her life if necessary. As she scanned the field with her eyes, ever watchful, her vision caught the large halberds and guards and chainmail. She saw what she thought were civilians behind them. Had the Dravians become so desperate? She didn't like the idea of killing untrained combatants, but if everything went to plan, she wouldn't have to. The almond army ground forward, step by step, the shield wall moved, halting occasionally did with pockets of resistance. The shield wall only broke under the onslaught of the summoned beast or the rare surprise attack of a sand wolf, dragging an armored soldier away into the desert. It had been a while since the last time she had seen one of the summoned creatures. Valerie guessed the exhaustion and the current state of the Dravian camp would make it hard to summon more. The shield wall stopped, now assaulted by a fresh wave of Dravian soldiers, perhaps inspired by the halberd wielding guards and civilians. The almond wall of flesh and still struck at them, as they baked under the noonday sun. Unusually long halberds and pikes struck back. The civilians huddled behind them, huddled around the brightly colored Dravian shamans. Valerie kept them in the corner of her eye as she scanned the battlefield, looking for immediate threats to her king. Wolf walked in the center of the Dravian witches, as they, ringed by the fanatics, approached the almond shield wall. The Dravian backline command must have gotten some of their men under control, as they now charged alongside Wolf's tent guard. They crashed against the almonds, and both forces ground to halt on the burning sands. The neophytes milled about behind the guards, unsure what to do. The guards lashed out with their long weapons exchanging blows with the almond line. Wolf, like most Dravians his age, was trained as a dervish, dual-wielding dancers of death, and while the fighting style worked against multiple opponents, it wasn't exactly effective against shield walls. He cursed his luck. If only they had been moments faster, they could have struck with the summoned beasts. He nervously pawned the scimitars on his hips as he looked around waiting for the next disaster to strike. He desperately wanted to protect the people around him, but his very own plan probably meant their death. A shrill cry answered his paranoia as one of the zealots was dragged away by an alien feline creature. Its large gray frame sunk low to the ground as it clutched the neophyte in its toothy maw. It pulled him through the mass of soldiers, avoiding them with ease. Most unaware of it, the screaming man in his jaw is the only clue of its presence. Wolf knew there was nothing he could do for him as the sand wolf disappeared into the crowd. The witches still ringed him, he was hoping to save their magic for Solomon's guards, but things were becoming desperate. He hoped the witches back in camp could resume their summon soon, but he wasn't sure if he could wait for them. The guards in front of him swung their halberds and pikes. He watched one of the guards' halberds bounce off an almond soldier's helm and lodge behind the man's shield. The guard pulled, trying to free it, as an almond longspear struck him in the eye. Wolf saw his moment. He pushed forward through the neophytes as he screamed, To me! Push! He grabbed the halberd shaft of the soldier and the shield wall recovered from the smack on the head. He pulled, yanking the man forward as he dodged the lethal spear tips. The neophytes yelled incoherent battle cries as they rushed the wall. A soldier of the second almond line grabbed his companion in the front, desperately, in an attempt to force the shield wall closed. Wolf struggled against him in a tug of war as neophytes died in front of him, trying to reach the tiny gap. A high-pitched whistle warbled by him and he thought his ears burst. 
He clutched him in pain as the soldier in the back line flew backward, struck by the sonic pulse. The lander pulled Wolf to his feet as the guards and neophytes streamed into the shield wall's crack. After she helped him up, he watched their progress for a minute while he recovered, then led the witches to join them. Valerie watched as the front and second lines were blown apart. The third line, men in reserve, pushed in to fill the gap. They were swarmed by the Dravian civilians, who seemed to have no concern for their safety. They fell, pierced by spear and sword as if they wished to see how many blows they could take. She, for a moment, panically looked towards Solomon to make sure he was still beside her. He hadn't moved, but she saw the motion in his posture, a tension like a cat about to pounce. The fourth line is the one they set in, with a line behind them. A fresh sixth line would be moving in soon. If she could manage to stop Solomon from doing anything reckless, they could win this without endangering him. She looked at him again. This time, the tension had left his body. Before she could question why, she saw the white gold armor of a royal guard headed towards the breach. She knew instantly it was Marcus, the oldest servant guard aside from her. She called out to him, Marcus, you fool, why are you breaking formation? He ignored her. She moved to pursue him, but Solomon raised a hand to stop her. He wanted another crack at the Dravian mage. Don't worry, I sent ours with him, Solomon said coldly, a tinge of jealousy perhaps coloring his voice. The lander stood facing a new wall, not unlike the last. A fresh line of soldiers poured at them. She was unsure what to do. The wishes behind her seemed to be following her lead and waited impatiently to see what she would do. Then he dashed past her. His bright red robe flashed as the scimitars in his hands whirled. Wolf headed towards an almond struggling with one of the guards. He broke his leg with a swift kick. With a precise cut between the soldier's gorget and helmet, he slit the man's throat as he danced past him. She raced after him, still unsure of what she should do. Then she saw it, what he ran towards, Solomon and his guard. She pointed at them and shouted as she looked back towards the witches who were following her. They seemed to get the hint, though she wasn't sure how. She spun back around, still running, and she spotted a white tuft of fur sticking out of the ground in front of her. She stopped instantly coming to rest on her tippy toes. Marcus, his shield drawn in cover, peeked over the top of it as he approached the young mage, mace drawn. She had yet to see him as she ran at him. Her head turned towards more of those accursed witches as she shouted something incomprehensible. She turned back around and ground to a halt. He at first thought it was because she had finally noticed him but he followed her gaze to the sand. There amidst the fine particles was a light gray, thin fibrous material that looked to him like a poorly made, ugly carpet. Her wariness of it made him wary of it, so he moved to step around it. She finally noticed him, her eyes following as he moved around the ugly, sand-filled rug. She stood there. Out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw movement. The gray mat moved slowly, and Marcus stopped. He had yet to see one up close, but he suddenly recalled seeing what looked like shaggy, light gray fur on the top of the backs of the creatures known as sand wolves. He looked back at the young Dravian. Once again, their eyes met over the back of the beast. Something of him was reflected there. Frustration. Urgency. He anchored his shield into the ground with a loud thud, and he pulled himself behind it, expecting the worst. It came. It hit the shield hard, but it didn't bowl him over. Instead, it flipped over the top of the large tower shield, landing on its shoulder. It sprang off its back legs with a snarl. Its front paws opened wide for an embrace, its dagger-like claws outstretched. Pivoting, Marcus slammed into it with his shield. It bounced off with a dull thud. It came back instantly, unfazed, screeching a horrendous sound no animal should make. It swung out batting the shield like a cat would a mouse. He dropped the shield again, sinking it into the sand. He put his weight behind it to weather the heavy hits. It gripped the shield in its terrible paws and pulled. It yanked him and the shield out of the sand. They went through an awkward few moments as the sand wolf yanked him off the ground and forward. Then again, he struggled to keep hold of the shield, holding on with both hands now, his mace abandoned. It gave up on pulling the shield away from him, and now, instead, it shook it violently, thrashing left and right. Marcus prayed his grip would hold. Two large canine fangs landed in front of his face, as it bit the top of the tower shield, pushing it down. The thing's nose set directly in front of his as he looked up into its eyes. It breathed a deep breath out through its mouth, and Marcus's nose was assaulted by the smell of rotten, fetid meat. Its eyes were malicious-filled orbs of bright yellow. A slit pupil ran down the middle. Four dots surrounded it. 
He felt like each dot was a new pupil, an eye within an eye, each looking for a way to spill his blood. A deep, almost inaudible growl echoed from his dark gray throat, and Marcus felt his heart threaten to stop. He knew the thing had the tower shield now, so he unclipped it from his arm and rolled backward. He drew a large paring dagger, the last weapon at his disposal, as he came to his feet. The creature drew the shield in, and it reminded Marcus of a large, naked gray house cat as it racked and bit the shield. Its yellow eyes focused on him, and it tossed the shield like a ball. It bounced like one across the sand, too, coming to rest twenty or so feet beside the creature. It bounded back up onto its feet, its long, lipless mouth exposing a row of sharp, saw-like teeth that ran down its long maw that was tipped with four overly large canines and a fleshy black nose. His front legs crouched low, its narrow whip of a tail wriggled like a snake. He pulled the dagger in front of himself, knowing he had no shot if he ran. It pounced, its front legs once again outstretched as if to embrace him, its hind lifted as though it meant to tear the air. Its mouth opened wide, exposing its whole length, dripping with a thick, mucous saliva. Lelandra watched Solomon's guard fight for his life. She was torn. No one deserved the fate of being eaten alive or worse, stuffed into a sand wolf cache. To slowly die from its poisonous bite, or dehydration, while the wolf waits for you to ripen. She looked towards Wolf. He fought beside a pair of guards, who had dropped their long weapons in favor of scavenged almond short swords. She looked to the witches behind her. Some ran past her, towards the man in the red mystic's robes. She frantically called out for them to help Wolf. Solomon watched Marcus head towards the Dravians with the fourth line. The armored Dravians clashed with them in melee, unable to form a shield wall. Marcus slipped through them and towards the mages with surprising ease. Solomon wondered where the mage he sent with Marcus was, but he didn't see the strange, lengthy man. Then his attention was drawn to a red-veiled mage fighting with the Dravian soldiers. He watched the mage dispatch his men in a red-flowing dance, and he couldn't help but wonder if some kind of magic was at work. He tried to look for Marcus again, but he had disappeared into the turning crowd of soldiers. Solomon wished him luck as he pushed forward, towards the mage. Valerie caught his arm after a step and said, Is this a wise idea, my lord? He tapped her arm reassuringly. Then he drew his sword, pointed it at the mage, and said, If I don't stop that one, many more will die. My lord, with all due respect, isn't that war? Men dying for their king? She replied, letting go of his arm. True, but it's my job to protect them from threats like these, he said. Then with a smile and a wink, he said, Besides, it will be fun. Valerie groaned. This is what she had feared. Solomon laughed, knowing all too well her thoughts. He lifted the drawn sword and commanded his royal guard forward. Phineas was a wizard. He had lived in Alma for most of his life and had seen the crown pass to three different kings now. It suited him fine since he had largely been ignored for most of his time in the country. He had spent the vast majority of his life probing the dark secrets of magic in quiet solitude and that was how he liked it. He thought himself immune to the wiles and wills of kings and nobility alike, but now found himself on a battlefield, on the order of a king himself. Marcus Valoris, second in command of the Royal Guard, had expressed certain fears, and Phineas was the only one left of the Almond Wizards who hadn't been exhausted after enchanting the guard's armor against magic. Therefore, he was the one unwillingly volunteered. Therefore, he was the one unwillingly volunteered. Now he had received yet another order to escort Marcus on his trip to combat the enemy mages. For the first time, it occurred to him that he might have to abandon Alma, his research, and everything he had built over the last 80 years, just to live. He had turned himself invisible shortly after Solomon had ordered him to protect Marcus, but only step in if you have to. There were some stipulations to the spell. It didn't mask his sounds, smells, or physical traces, like footprints in the sand. Touching another living creature or casting another spell would break it as well. He had started following Marcus at a ten-foot pace, careful not to run into any of the soldiers running around him, but now the distance had grown considerably between them. Phineas growled to himself as he watched Marcus simply slide between the Dravian soldiers. It was like the group hadn't seen him at all or didn't care about one more soldier heading to the front line when the Almond King was right there, in front of them. He tried to figure out a way through the fighting Dravians, a way to follow Marcus, Again, he thought of abandoning the guard to whatever fate had in store, abandoning Alma. It would be like abandoning his life, but at least he would be alive. 
Wolf blocked the blow and struck back while he kept an eye on the Amun royal guard's slow, methodical advance. Another line of Amun soldiers rushed in front of them, meeting him and the guards in waves. His guards fell around him, unable to hold off the crushing tide. He found himself surrounded. Only four of the guards remained, forced to his side by a closing wall of swords. Ghosts floated around him, laughing. Memories not his own swirled on the cusp of his mind as he pushed them away. His skin burned as he tried to rein himself under control. A rhythm like a heartbeat stuck in his ears as he felt the chains pushing him to free them, to free himself. A bright flash of light blinded him. He was unsure if it was real. A boom followed the flash, and the rhythm was knocked from his head. Flashes of bright colors, chaos, and a cacophony of magic were leveled upon the soldiers surrounding him. After the ringing in his ears was gone, a new noise greeted him, the singing and screaming of Dravian witches. They filed in around him, replacing the almond soldiers that had fallen. He didn't see Lilandra. He grabbed one of the witches in front of him. Forget the plan. It's all gone to Hattree. What's the biggest summon you can pull off? He said. She looked at him and said with sadness in her voice, After that, I don't think we could pull off anything impressive. Could you summon something specific? He said. What are you thinking? She replied. Lalandra stretched out her hand as she screamed. A powerful gust of wind caught the pouncing sand wolf under its chest as it leaped at the royal arm and guard. She had wanted to throw the creature. She had expected it to go flying at least a few feet. Instead, the gust stopped the creature's forward momentum and had hovered there for a second before gently landing. It seemed confused, wondering why its claws and teeth were not buried in armor and flesh. It looked at Lalandra and its eyes narrowed. The almond guard followed its gaze. Lalandra gulped. It let out some kind of snarl as it charged at her. The almond tried to stab it as it ran past him. The large dagger skidded across the sandwich's gray skin. It didn't even notice the impact. Its eyes focused in murderous rage. She scanned her mind for a spell. She had plenty of energy left, plenty of elements to draw off of. But she also knew sandwiches were incredibly hardy to those same elements. She didn't have time. She panicked and dropped to a knee as she conjured a shield of light. It bounced off of it with a hearty impact, skidding backward. She held her breath. The spell was a beginner's one. It didn't cost much energy and was pretty efficient at absorbing blows, but she was unable to move while the spell was active. Her knee needed to be in contact with the ground. To make matters worse, the shield didn't cover her completely. Her back and shoulders were vulnerable. It stared at her through the shield. Its eyes peeled open, unblinking. Its wide toothy mouth hung open as it flexed its claws. She briefly thought of changing the shield's color so she didn't have to see the pacing monster, and then the almond guard stabbed at it from behind. It whirled on him like a snake smacking at him with its deadly paw. He jumped back from the strike, slashing as he went. The dagger slid between the padding on its paw and it hissed in pain as it struck in fury at where the man had been standing. Lalandra took that as her opening, and she released the shield. She jumped up and moved her feet in a rhythmic stepping motion towards the beast as she swayed her hands. The ball of electricity that formed in her hands was probably the most perfect connection she had ever had with lightning. She let it flow through her, then out of her outstretched palm. It sparked between her and the creature, hitting the thing right behind its front leg, where she assumed its heart would be. It yelled in pain, trembled, then collapsed, a smoky black cloud streaming from the charcoal flesh. The almond soldier looked at her, his dagger aimed at her, and then suddenly he was pulled down. The sand was stood, dazed, the man's leg now in its mouth. Lalander pulled on one last bell. If this didn't work, she wasn't sure what else she could do to hurt the creature. It bit down hard on the guard's leg, and the armor made a terrible rending sound as he screamed. It moved to run away as she slung the spell. The sonic vibration rippled through the air and hit the creature in its left hind leg with a satisfying crunch. It dropped the guard, and this time, it was the one that screamed. Its hind leg hung limp at the hip, dangling off it as it turned to face her snapping and snarling. She acted to cast a spell again, but the wolf went strangely quiet. Its eyes focused on her hands intensely. She slung the spell out again, and the wolf opened its mouth wide, letting out a low, single bark. The rippling air dissipated into nothingness. She stared at the wolf wide-eyed, unable to come to terms with what had just happened. It growled a sound that reminded her of grinding metal, 
then it charged at her sloppily on its three legs. She came to her senses a moment before its right paw made contact with her ribs. She tried to soften the blow with a gust of wind, but the unformed spell did little to cushion the blow. She was sent flying a dozen or so feet to her right. Landing on her ass, she skidded across the sand. A large chunk of her purple robe lay stuck in the thing's claws. Large scratches ran down her ribs. It shook the pierced cloth free while turning to her. While Andrew struggled to shield herself again as it slowly sauntered over to her. It smacked the shield angrily, slashing with its large claws. She bent back on her knee, hoping to protect as much of herself as she could. It opened its mouth like a snake. It stretched its jaws over the shield, and two of its four large canine teeth hung uncomfortably close to her shoulders. She began to get pushed back, off of her knee. All she could see now was the thing's throat. She began to wonder if the shield would break as she was followed, or if it would break by the creature pushing her prone. Suddenly, it let go. It screamed a high-pitched roar while it backed away from her, shaking its head. The almond guard hung off it, a large dagger buried deep in the thing's eye. It shook the guard wrapped around its neck. It stepped backward as it shook. Its ruined leg gave out and it landed on its side. The guard pulled the blade out, then plunged it back into the socket viciously. It squealed, then convulsed, going still. She let the shield go and stood. The guard did the same, pulling the dagger free. He aimed it at Lelandra as he slid off the wolf's neck. As he landed on his wrecked armored leg, it gave out like the wolf's leg had, and he fell back onto the thing, his back resting on it. He tried to stand, but his leg slipped out from under him, weak and soggy. Apparently, the wolf's venom had kicked in. She watched him for a moment as his bloody dagger began to sag towards the ground, eventually falling out of his hands. She bent down to check on him, briefly thinking about curing his paralysis. It wasn't fatal, but he would stay like this until he was cured. His leg didn't look too bad either, though that was just based on the amount of blood that leaked from the armor. She touched the scratches on her ribs, thankful that the poison was stored in the sandwich's large canine teeth. She felt her feet lift off the ground. She found herself tumbling over the wolf's body. Phineas was finally free of the Dravian and almond soldiers that had been blocking his path, as the Dravian mages felled a group of almonds. The common almond foot soldier gave the group room and he walked through that space, maintaining his invisibility. He scanned the battlefield for the royal guard Marcus, unable to see the white and gold armor. His eyes were instead drawn to the body of a beast. A Dravian mage dressed in purple stood at the creature's neck. That's when he saw the white gauntlet, dagger in hand as it dipped and dropped. He saw the mage touch her side, and his invisibility wore off as he summoned a blast of wind that lifted her up and over the royal guard. She spun across the creature's body, landing on the opposite side of it. He walked forward, unsure of what she would do next. He looked at Marcus, hoping the guard was still alive. The little mage stood, unsure of what had happened. Then she locked eyes with Phineas. He pulled a ball of fire between his hands with a word and a pinch of sulfur. He heaved it at her. She reached out with her left hand as if she would catch it. It lit her hand ablaze, and she screamed. An orb of wind shifted around it, and the blaze was snuffed out. Phineas was shocked. He had never seen a magic spell spontaneously wink into existence like that. She looked at him. Anger smoldered in her eyes behind the purple veil. She swayed her hands, and a ball of electricity formed. He saw the electricity form and began his own spell. She swayed again, and the ball flew from her middle and index finger as she aimed it at him. He threw his own electricity spell at her, and the spells collided, then sputtered into nothingness. The principle was relatively simple. Two opposing forces of the same or opposite elements would cancel each other out. It was a basic wizard defense against all forms of magic. Well, as long as you knew what elements the spell dealt with. The Dravian mage didn't seem to know that. Her eyes had gone wide under the veil as she stood rigid. Phineas pulled another pinch of sulfur out of the pouch at his waist. He flung it forward as he willed another ball of fire at the young woman. She dived out of the way this time, behind the beast's body. The flames raced across it harmlessly. This wasn't a wizard stool. He wasn't even sure he could call her a mage. He was probably six years older than her when he first traveled to Reba Moat, the mage's academy, an independent city-state at the northernmost point on the continent. He left the academy, following his master, only ten short years later. He was surprised that this pup of a mage knew as much as she did, but then, her magic seemed different from the learned magic of the hollowed halls of Reva. He rolled some salt crystals around in his hand as he waited for her to pop back up. 
She poked her head up, looking at him over the creature's massive thigh. He couldn't help but laugh at the absurdness as he held his hand up and spoke the words. The salt crystals flew off his hand and formed a column of wind like a battering ram. It hit her in the sternum, sending her flying backward again. She screamed and cursed in a language she didn't know as she rolled on the ground, clutching her chest. He watched her warily as he walked around the creature to face her. It was a shame to have to kill her. There was so much he wanted to learn. But it wouldn't be prudent to leave her alive. He pulled a tiny vial of water from his pouches. He aimed it at her as he spoke the spell. The vial broke and four little water droplets lifted above his hand. They froze and formed two-inch long needles. They flew with the young mage. She screamed as she lifted her hand. A dribble of flame lashed out and the needles disappeared into a puff of steam. She pulled herself onto her knees, and Phineas tried to hit her with another bolt of wind. A shield of light sprang up between them. The column of wind hit it and spread out round it harmlessly. A cacophony of noise sprouted from behind Phineas. An unnatural, unearthly howl echoed out behind him. It sounded like a thousand swords had been swallowed by a tornado. Then a hundred quieter howls joined it from across the battlefield. A shiver ran down his spine as the atmosphere of the midday field turned. Every combatant felt like the eyes of a predator watched them. Solomon watched the Dravian mages as he marched forward with his guard. They had not moved since they had ringed the one in the red robes and had set up some kind of shield wall. Three of the colorfully robed mages kneeled on their left knees. A fourth stood above the center one holding her shoulders. A large shield of light stretched the length of the mages. It was an odd red color, obscuring what lay behind it in silhouettes that moved. It reminded him of a Kari peep show. His guard walked up to the wall, almost questioningly. They timidly knocked on it with their weapons. He sighed and ordered them to walk around it as he walked towards the wall himself. He pulled his short sword into his hand and aimed it at the standing center mage's face. He lifted it back to swing, and the mage pulled her kneeling friend back, breaking the magical wall. The wall's fall revealed the rest of the mages. Dancing, directly opposite of him stood the mage in red. They seemed to be leading the group in some sort of ritual, but their motions ran opposite, quick jerking hand motions compared to the fluid dances of the other witches. Four armored dravians stood at the front, as the mages of the impromptu shield wall rolled back. They stood threatening with stolen short spears, not looking to score a hit, just hoping to make an almond think twice. The mages of the shield wall fired off magic as they rolled behind the guards. The various magics bounced off Solomon's royal guards. He had spent almost his entire force of magic wielders on the temporary enchantments, and he suddenly felt vindicated in the decision as a bolt of lightning skidded off his armor. He pulled his shield high, preparing to charge when the Dravian mage had stopped dancing. The mage and Red's hands met, their fingers moving quickly in a series of dizzying motions. Something about the motions brought a memory to Solomon. The tattoo on his hip burned in recognition. He heard a name whispered in his ear. Catholion. Something about the name was visceral to his subconscious, and a flood of terror ran over him. The mage in red finished the hand motions, and the red ropes lit up like a bonfire as the witch spontaneously combusted. A creature emerged from the sands of Dravia, pulling itself through a magical circle on the ground with long clawed paws. It looked like a mutated sand wolf. The name Catholion rang in his head again, and he suddenly remembered the real name for the creatures known as sand wolves, the spawn of Catholion. It stood easily twice the size of a sand wolf. Instead of the normal gray mane, it was a vibrant yellow. Stripes in the same shade ran across its dark gray skin. Thorn-like spines ran up and down it. Two swept-back horns jutted out from in front of its ears. The normally fleshy nose was peeled back. Red, bloody, and skeletal. It thrashed as if it was bound in chains, shaking and pulling. The mages still stood around it in a circle and moving, their eyes closed. It continued to struggle until one of its eight, beady eyes caught Solomon in its vision. It twisted to face him, taking him in with all of its eyes. It seemed to chortle a piping metal sound, and then it went rigid. It ran at him. He prepared to block it as Valerie grabbed him and yanked him back. It jumped over the top of both of them. Now standing in the middle of his guards, it let out a heart-stopping howl, like the sound of a thousand swords being bashed into each other. Howls greeted it in an all-too-eager choir. Salmon looked back to the mages as they fell to the ground exhausted, except for one. He stood there at the center of the mages, badly burned, disfigured, and naked. The ender, Wolf, his tattoos flashing between an orangish red and a cold black. Wolf hoped the thing could be slain. Catalion shouldn't be walking among the denizens of the material plane. It was one of the lesser primes of... He didn't know what he was thinking. Words rushed through his head. He questioned which were actually his own. 
He watched the thing, Kithalion, tear into the royal guard. It seemed to be watching Solomon as it did so. It kept a healthy distance away from the ender as it ripped his guard apart. Solomon didn't watch the beast. His eyes were locked onto Wolf. Wolf said to no one in particular in a serious tone, Get the tired witches out of here. Run for your lives. The guards that were left standing and the witches that shielded him rushed to obey his command. Or perhaps they rushed to save their own lives. Wolf wished them the best of luck, but he was unsure how they could make it. Sandwolves, Cathalian spawn, ran to and fro, slaying indiscriminately as they went. Cathalion's orders were clear. Kill everything. Eat later. The two enders eyed each other through the chaos. Wolf waited to see what Solomon would do. His lone personal guard pulled at him trying to get the king to return to camp. Wolf finally let the voices take him, and he released the chains from his skin. They fell with a sickly thump. He wrapped a link coming from his wrist around both his hands. The middle of the chains looked a deeper red. Steam ran off them as he ran at Solomon, raising his right arm. Solomon pushed his guard to the side as he raised his shield. Wolf slapped his shield with the chain in his raised arm, then he slipped to the left side of it. He punched the king in the face with his left fist. The king's helm tinged and Wolf's knuckles came back bloody. Solomon stumbled back from the impact. His guard stepped forward and smacked Wolf bodily with the large tower shield she wielded. He fell backward. The blow knocked him flat and the air out of him. He rolled to his feet sloppily, trying not to burn off one of his limbs. Solomon regained his composure and launched himself at Wolf. Wolf watched the guard pull her spear off her back as he slapped the chains at Solomon, trying to keep him at a distance. Something caught his attention, the blonde girl, as Solomon closed in on him. He barely dodged a short sword thrust, and he reposited by kicking Solomon's knee with all his force. A dreadful pop sounded, and Solomon grunted in dissatisfaction. Wolf had used that move in the fighting pits to shatter opponent's kneecaps, but the thick metal armor must have absorbed the mass of the impact. Or maybe it was the fact that he no longer had shoes on. Wolf used the opportunity to back away from Solomon, and his guard closed in, spearing at him. Wolf dodged into the spear and slashed out with his left arm. The chain sailed through the air, cutting the spear in half. It traveled through the guard's helm, blinding her. She didn't scream. She lashed out again with the broken spear. Wolf smacked it aside as he wrapped the length of the chain up his right arm. He had to jump to hit her in the chest, where her heart was, where it had been. He pulled his hand back and Solomon screamed. He hobbled at Wolf, swinging wildly. Wolf shook the chain on his right arm loose and lifted it to, once again, swing at the king and enter. Lelander held the shield spell up as a column of wind hit it, and a second later, a horrendous howl rang out, followed by the sounds of hundreds of smaller howls. The two casters' eyes never left each other as a stampede of heavy footfalls landed around them. Sandwolves rushed past the duo as they contemplated their next moves. Lelander's left hand stung furiously from the burn she had sustained earlier. One of the first spells a young wish was taught was how to summon a ball of fire, and it was a common game among them to toss that spell to one another. How she felt to catch this almond mages shocked her and bruised her pride along with burning her hand. The way he had managed to snuff out her lightning spell, maybe almond mages were masters of the elements after all. She watched the black robes carefully as she clung onto the shield spell, her strength waning. The almond mage pulled something from a pouch on his hip, and a column of flame roared to life in the mage's palm. He aimed it at her, and it screamed into the shield. The heat was intense, and the flames licked at her shoulders as they ran around the construct of light. She gritted her teeth to avoid screaming in pain. The spell faded, and she was once again face to face with the almond through the shield. He prepared the spell again. Panic ran through her, then a deathly calm as an idea came to her. She let the shield fade as she stood. She swayed her hip. Her feet moved in an elegant circle as she twisted her hands. The mage aimed the cone of fire again, and she screamed her defiance back at it. She couldn't summon ice like the almond mage could, but she could try another one of his tricks. A whirlpool of flames leapt from her hands, mingling with the mages. The two spells circled each other, roiling and boiling on the sand until they merged into something wholly unfamiliar. A globe of fire akin to the sun spun in place, then it wobbled and slowly tottered towards the almond mage. He screamed and hurled a mote of wind at it. It wobbled again, then winked out of existence. He looked at her incredulously. She did her best to feign strength. She saw him pull something from his pouch again, and a large javelin of clay formed over his palm. He moved to throw it at her. She tried to imitate him again as she swayed, pulling a cluster of sand in front of her. 
She tried to form it like he had, but it resisted her. Instead, it spun faster and faster in a circle in front of her as she tried to shape it. The javelin flew at her. As its tip touched the circle of flying sand, it stopped dead. It trembled in place, and she wheeled the sand forward, hoping to fling it back at the mage. It once again resisted, this time against the mage's will. The javelin broke apart, joining into the circle of sand as the circle spun out of her control. It morphed and twisted, ripping the sand underneath it into itself. The more sand it swallowed, the faster it spun, until suddenly, with a whoosh, it exploded. Lalander covered her face as a rush of wind and sand shock waved out from it. She was knocked from her feet, backward at first, then she was picked up and tossed forward. She landed hard on something, and all her strength left her. She blinked and tried to look around. When the clashing spells dissipated, they tossed motes of wind around the battlefield. A torrent of sand and dust devils now flitted across it. She tried to stand, but whatever she had landed on slipped out from underneath her, and she fell. She looked back at what she had been on and realized it was the sandwich she had helped slay earlier. The Almond Royal Guard still sat at the front of it, and now she lay on the ground at his outstretched legs. She pulled herself over to him in a crawl, her strength quickly sapping away. She had used too much magic, and her consciousness was fading. Sand swirled around her as she tried to prop herself up. Her arms gave out and she slumped face first into the sand next to the guard as her eyes closed. Phineas blinked through tear-stained, irritated eyes as a mild sandstorm slipped around him. He had no idea where the young mage had gone off to. He had no idea where he was now. The chaotic mixing of spells had sent him flying. What was that young mage thinking? Trying to brute force a counterspell like that. She's lucky if she's still alive. Shadows moved around him. Silhouettes in the sandy walls. He was nearly out of prepared spells. He had maybe a few attack spells left, and a few that were for his survival. He supposed abandoning his research wasn't a terrible idea if it meant keeping his life. Besides, he might have found a new research topic to study here in the desert of Dravia. He readied himself to cast a spell he rarely used, but always had prepared, as he pulled a feather and a few salt crystals from a pouch. He said the words, and he zipped through the sandy fog into the sky. He didn't look back as he departed, the time allowance on the spell didn't let him, and he doubted he would have anyway. Solomon thrust a short sword at Wolf. Wolf jumped backward and snapped the chain at him. Solomon deftly parried it with the shield as he sliced in a downward arc with the sword. Wolf bounced it away with a link wrapped around his left arm. Solomon screamed in frustration. Wolf said nothing, a scowl on what was left of his face. A number of Catholion spawn formed a circle around the Enders. Solomon knew it was over. For him, anyway. Whether Alma went on to conquer Dravia after this was no longer up to him. As soon as he saw Wolf standing there, he knew it. The tattoos on the Dravian Ender glowed bright orange and pulsed a sickly red as they slithered across his body. Solomon's only hope now was that he could kill the Ender before the inevitable happened. Even then, it wasn't a guarantee. There were stories of Enders exploding in their death throes. Solomon swung the short orange glowing sword in a horizontal arc. Wolf jumped back away from it again. Solomon pushed forward with his shield. Wolf jumped to Solomon's right and tried to punch him, but Solomon swung the sword up and Wolf's left arm tumbled away. The chain disappeared and the tattoos went cold on it as the arm just above the elbow separated from his body. He didn't scream. He did punch with his right arm, forcing Solomon to lift the shield to defend himself. Solomon thrust forward with his short sword, but Wolf didn't dodge it. It pierced him through the center of his body, and he stepped forward into it. The sword burned through him easily, and soon Solomon's forearm was inside the wound. He tried to pull back away from Wolf, but the Ender grabbed him under his shield arm and pulled him close. Solomon let go of his weapons as he kicked and punched trying to force him to let go. Wolf's eyes were glazed over as if he were dead already. He looked Solomon in the eyes, and some kind of light returned to them, and his tattoos shifted, changing from links of chains to links of thorny vines as he said, I remember you. I remember everything. The sickly red of the pulsing now permanently covered the length of the thorny vines. Their brightness blinded Solomon. Then everything was black. Where was he again? Who was he? Lalander awoke to a rumble. She tried to open her eyes, but they wouldn't budge. She felt a searing heat and an intense pressure on her back. She felt sick as she was tossed, spinning uncontrollably. She tried to brace herself, but her body wouldn't respond. She crashed into something, and then something heavy smashed into her back. 
She became entangled with the objects as she spun. Something hard and sharp pressed into her cheek, tearing it open. She felt the blood trickle down her face as she came to a rest. She once again tried to open her eyes. To move. But it was no use. She didn't have the strength yet to do either. She felt herself drift out of consciousness again, and she fell into a deep sleep. She woke up much later. The sun had begun to set, and the chill had awoken her. She tried to stand, and found that she was pinned to the ground by something heavy. She felt the sensation of cold metal underneath her as she looked down. The almond royal guard lay there, unmoving. She shimmied and squirmed, freeing herself from under the body of the sand wolf. She looked at the guard and the grotesquerie, tangled up together in a lump. She decided to at least pull his helmet off to see if he was still alive, and was shocked to see his eyes were staring, unblinkingly ahead. A pang of guilt ran through her as she remembered the venom that paralyzed him, and she began to cast a spell to heal the affliction. As the spell was completed, he began to sob quietly. He turned his head looking behind Lalandra. She followed his gaze and realized how quiet it was. A few bodies lay about, lots of dead sand wolves, but what struck her the most was the crater in the sand. A mirror of melted sand reflected the sun, dimmed by the streams of fine particles already filling it in. There was a smell to the air, not blood, nor burning bodies, but an ozone smell. No armies held the field. Almond and Dravian camps alike were being torn down. Some field medics and mages braved the field looking for survivors. No one seemed interested in retrieving what remained of the dead. Almond soldiers milled about their camp, unsure of what to do. Dravians broke down their camps and scattered into the desert to return to their clans. She looked to the almond soldier again. What do you want to do? We can't stay here long, she said. Caleb sat next to Leah in the witch's covered canvas wagon as he picked through Wolf's journal. If it held a secret to open the locked box he had given him and Leah, Caleb was unsure of where it was. He scrawled through the pages, which, at first, were organized thoughts directly from the living god's head. They quickly turned into disjointed recollections. Sometimes the pages were in a different language entirely, or the writing was smeared and so archaic that Caleb had a hard time deciphering them. He had turned to Leah many times during the travel so far, trying to discuss his findings or lack thereof, but she shushed him in an effort to maintain the illusion of their shared vow of silence. They had heard sandwiches out in the distance multiple times, and the caravan of covered wagons seemed to be marching along as quickly as it could. The air in the wagon hung thick with dirt, palpable tension and silence. He turned once again to Leah, the journal in his hand. She had had no interest in looking at the book, and the times he had tried to hand it to her, she had gently pushed it back to him, so this time he didn't bother to try. Before he could say anything, she raised her hand to silently shush him again, but before she could, a roaring sound echoed out from behind the wagon. A rush of hot air rocked the wagon. And then, with a whoosh, it brought a torrent of sand that assailed the caravan. Then, silence. All the eyes in the wagon looked behind them, towards the long-departed battlefield. No one there could see it from this distance. No one there could see past the camels that led the wagon behind them. But they all looked. No one wanted to break the silence that had torn the old one asunder. Caleb bound the journal the way that Wolf had before he had handed it to him. He no longer wanted to think about what the future held for him. He no longer wanted to talk to Leah about the book. He wanted to close his eyes and forget everything for a moment. As he tied the last binding on the book, he noticed a strange shine from inside the book's spine. He carefully put the book in his lap and pressed the cover hard as he slid his index finger into the spine. He felt the shape of a key tucked into a small pocket. Then he finished binding it. Even after finding the key, his thoughts had not changed. The idea of opening the box now made him a little queasy. He slid the journal into his borrowed witch's robes, above his heart, as he slumped under the wagon's bench. He closed his eyes as he tried not to think about the last fifteen years of his life, or what next week might bring. Cathelion watched the caravans of wagons departing the battlefield campsites from a jutting, rocky outcrop he lounged on leagues away from the chaos. He had lost scores of his spawn to the explosion, and he knew that would be the cost, but he couldn't pass up on evening the score with the Champion of Light. Shield. It may have been thousands of years since they had last met, but he wasn't one to forget, especially a disfigurement. He tried to wrinkle his nose, and a stinging, searing pain greeted him back. His eyes narrowed on the crater left behind by the Champion of Dark, Thorns, Death Rose. His pain felt a little eased. 
He didn't know why Thorne had reached out to him. All their packs had long concluded. But it was an opportunity he couldn't resist. Unlike a normally summoned creature, he did not risk true death from being here in the material plane. None of the primes feared death, lesser or greater. He breathed in a deep, long breath through his mouth, filling his massive lungs with the cool air of the desert. He would have to adapt to the coolness of this world if he wanted to leave this sand-filled place. It had been far too long, thousands and thousands of years since he had walked the Aerodome's fertile lands, and he wanted to see the ways in which it had changed. He stood and shook the sand from his body. He would have to prepare for the night chill. It would take time before his skin was thicken enough to withstand the cold. He took a second to gaze over the ruined field of bodies and the hurried camps that were packing up. Then he set his eyes on one of the covered wagons of the desert dwellers, and he began tracking it in a slow gallop. He left his spawn behind. They would only slow him down. He loved them, but in a distant, cold way, like one would love the tip of their fingernail or a single strand of hair. Given enough time, he could always make more. A smile spread across his face. He was going to enjoy his time here. Ten years later, after what historians now call the Shield Thorn War, the former countries of Dravia and Alma had collapsed. Dravia's nomadic tribesmen left the capital city and the large port town of Leviathan Bay, leaving only those without a clan or foreign arch. They left her to store their clan's neighbors after so many fell in the war. The two large cities quickly became dens of crime and disorder. Old Alma and platoons still wandered the desert, now as mercenaries and bandits. The tribes became isolated and warred among themselves for the rare resources the sands held. Only the hidden oasis, the little town that started Dravia's rise to kingdom, remained untouched. It was still used as a neutral trade town between the tribes, hidden deep within the sands. The streets of the capital became accessible for a new brand of cultist, devoted to blood and strange monsters, while the caverns below it became home to a new breed of Dravian witch. The twelve tribes of Dravia slowly regained their strength as they shifted seasonally across the sands and valleys. Alma after having expanded so far, so fast, once again was sundered into smaller kingdoms. No clear line of succession and the massive death toll of soldiers and generals led to infighting, which led to a civil war and multiple rebellions. The kingdom slowly crumbled under its weight as portions of it were annexed. The winner of the civil war tried desperately to keep what was left of the kingdom afloat as portions of the military abandoned their posts. Lelandra strolled through the newly erected tents of Isla Roar, set up in their springtime spot. The clan had fended off an Islaha raid the day before, and she was on something of a patrol, looking for anything amiss. Isla Roar had always been a small clan, but the war left their numbers few indeed. But they had always been a clan of magic as well. She spotted her soon-to-be husband, working hard, as usual, putting the finishing touches on the couple's newly made tent. His short hair and light complexion made him stand out among the men of Isla Roar. After she had guided him off the battlefield, it had taken her a long time to get him to speak again, and even longer to teach him the language. The two had become close in that time, but had only become lovers a couple of years ago. She thought to call out to Marcus, but decided it would be better to finish her round so she could meet him for an afternoon break before she had to train the youngling witches. Caleb and Leah had proved to be invaluable members of the clan. Caleb had a unique combat training compared to most Dravians, and he was more than willing to teach. Leah had some magic potential, but she really shined in organization and leadership roles. She had become something of a camp foreman. Lalanda rounded a corner, and a flash of black caught her eye as it shrieked behind a tense fabric covering. Something about it seemed familiar, and she rushed after it. She sped around the corner, and almost crashed into a tall, lanky figure hidden in the shadows of the tent. The figure spun in surprise, and an old wrinkly face met Lalandra's gaze. The two stared at each other for a second, then a goofy grin began to spread across the old man's face as Phineas said, I finally found you. Wolf woke up with a startle. The pitch black of early morning still encompassed his room. He ran his right hand over his eye, making sure it was still there as he ran his left hand over his stomach. The sweat dripped off him as the sleep wore off. He couldn't believe how real that dream was. He had even forgotten his own name. He wasn't a wolf. His name was Soren Oliver, and he wasn't a fighter. Soren settled himself, hoping to return to sleep, eager to claim a few more hours before the morning's early rays brought a new day. A pain like he was being burnt suddenly touched his left shoulder, 
and he gritted his teeth.